Preface of the Analysis of Mind by Bertrand Russell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For please visit LibriVox.org. The Analysis of Mind by Bertrand Russell. Preface. This book has grown out of an attempt to harmonize two different tendencies, one in psychology, the other in physics, with both of which I find myself in sympathy, although at first sight they might seem inconsistent. On the one hand, many psychologists, especially those of the behaviorist school, tend to adopt what is essentially a materialistic position, as a matter of method, if not of metaphysics. They make psychology increasingly dependent on physiology and external observation, and tend to think of matter as something much more solid and indubitable than mind. Meanwhile, the physicists, especially Einstein and the other exponents of the theory of relativity, have been making matter less and less material. Their world consists of events, from which matter is derived by a logical construction. Whoever reads, for example, Professor Eddington's Space, Time, and Gravitation, will see that an old-fashioned materialism can receive no support from modern physics. I think that what has permanent value in the outlook of the behaviorists is the feeling that physics is the most fundamental science at present in existence. But this position cannot be called materialistic if, as seems to be the case, physics does not assume the existence of matter. The view that seems to me to reconcile the materialistic tendency of psychology with the anti-materialistic tendency of physics is the view of William James and the American New Realists, according to which the stuff of the world is neither mental nor material, but a neutral stuff, out of which both are constructed. I have endeavored in this work to develop this view in some detail as regards the phenomena with which psychology is concerned. My thanks are due to Professor John B. Watson and to Dr. T. P. Nunn for reading my manuscript at an early stage and helping me with many valuable suggestions. Also to Mr. A. Wolgamuth for much very useful information as regards important literature. I have also to acknowledge the help of the editor of this Library of Philosophy, Professor Muirhead, for several suggestions by which I have profited. The work has been given in the form of lectures, both in London and Beijing, and one lecture, that on desire, has been published in the Athenium. There are a few allusions to China in this book, all of which were written before I had been in China, and are not intended to be taken by the reader as geographically accurate. I have used China merely as a synonym for a distant country, when I wanted illustrations of unfamiliar things. Beijing, January 1921 End of Preface Lecture One, Part One of Analysis of Mind by Bertrand Russell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Neufeld. Lecture One Recent Criticisms of Consciousness. Part One there are certain occurrences which we are in the habit of calling mental among these we may take as typical believing and desiring the exact definition of the word mental will i hope emerge as the lectures proceed for the present i shall mean by it whatever occurrences would commonly be called mental i wish in these lectures to analyze as fully as i can what it is that really takes place when we, for example, believe or desire. In this first lecture I shall be concerned to refute a theory which is widely held, and which I formerly held myself. The theory that the essence of everything mental is a certain quite peculiar something called consciousness, conceived either as a relation to objects or as a pervading quality of psychical phenomena. 
the reasons which i shall give against this theory will be mainly derived from previous authors there are two sorts of reasons which will divide my lecture into two parts one direct reasons derived from analysis and its difficulties two indirect reasons derived from observation of animals comparative psychology and of the insane and hysterical psychoanalysis few things are more firmly established in popular philosophy than the distinction between mind and matter those who are not professional metaphysicians are willing to confess that they do not know what mind actually is or how matter is constituted but they remain convinced that there is an impassable gulf between the two and that both belong to what actually exists in the world philosophers on the other hand have maintained often that matter is a mere fiction imagined by mind and sometimes that mind is a mere property of a certain kind of matter those who maintain that mind is reality and matter an evil dream are called idealists a word which has a different meaning in philosophy from that which it bears in ordinary life those who argue that matter is the reality and mind a mere property of protoplasm are called materialists they have been rare among philosophers but common at certain periods among men of science idealists materialists and ordinary mortals have been in agreement on one point but they knew sufficiently what they meant by the words mind and matter to be able to conduct their debate intelligently yet it was just in this point as to which they were at one that they seemed to me to have been all alike in error the stuff of which the world of our experience is composed is in my belief neither mind nor matter but something more primitive than either both mind and matter seem to be composite and the stuff of which they are compounded lies in a sense between the two in a sense above them both like a common ancestor as regards matter i have set forth my reasons for this view on former occasions and i shall not now repeat them but the question of mind is more difficult and it is this question that i propose to discuss in these lectures a great deal of what i shall have to say is not original indeed much recent work in various fields has tended to show the necessity of such theories as those which i shall be advocating accordingly in this first lecture i shall try to give a brief description of the systems of ideas within which our investigation is to be carried on if there is one thing that may be said in the popular estimation to characterize mind that one thing is consciousness we say that we are conscious of what we see and hear of what we remember and of our own thoughts and feelings most of us believe that tables and chairs are not conscious we think that when we sit in a chair we are aware of sitting in it but it is not aware of being sat in it cannot for a moment be doubted that we are right in believing that there is some difference between us and the chair in this respect so much may be taken as fact and as a datum for our inquiry but as soon as we try to say what exactly the difference is we become involved in perplexities is consciousness ultimate and simple something to be merely accepted and contemplated or is it something complex perhaps consisting in our way of behaving in the presence of objects or alternatively in the existence in us of things called ideas having a certain relation to objects though different from them and only symbolically representative of them such questions are not easy to answer but until they are answered we cannot profess to know what we mean by saying that we are possessed of consciousness before considering modern theories let us look first at consciousness from the standpoint of conventional psychology since this embodies views which naturally occur when we begin to reflect upon the subject for this purpose let us as a preliminary consider different ways of being conscious first there is the way of perception we perceive tables and chairs horses and dogs our friends traffic passing in the street in short anything which we recognize through the senses i leave on one side for the present the question whether pure sensation is to be regarded as a form of consciousness 
what i am speaking of now is perception where according to conventional psychology we go beyond the sensation to the thing which it represents when you hear a donkey bray you not only hear a noise but realize that it comes from a donkey when you see a table you not only see a colored surface but realize that it is hard the addition of these elements that go beyond a crude sensation is said to constitute perception we shall have more to say about this at a later stage for the moment i am merely concerned to note that perception of objects is one of the most obvious examples of what is called consciousness we are conscious of anything that we perceive we may take next the way of memory if i set to work to recall what i did this morning that is a form of consciousness different from perception since it is concerned with the past there are various problems as to how we can be conscious now of what no longer exists these will be dealt with incidentally when we come to the analysis of memory from memory it is an easy step to what are called ideas not in the platonic sense but in that of locke berkeley and hume in which they are opposed to impressions you may be conscious of a friend either by seeing him or thinking of him and by thought you can be conscious of objects which cannot be seen such as the human race or physiology thought in the narrower sense is that form of consciousness which consists in ideas as opposed to impressions or mere memories we may end our preliminary catalogue with belief by which i mean that way of being conscious which may be either true or false we say that a man is conscious of looking a fool by which we mean that he believes he looks a fool and is not mistaken in his belief this is a different form of consciousness from any of the earlier ones it is the form which gives knowledge in the strict sense and also error it is at least apparently more complex than our previous forms of consciousness though we shall find that they are not so separable from it as they might appear to be besides ways of being conscious there are other things that will ordinarily be called mental such as desire and pleasure and pain these raise problems of their own which we shall reach in lecture three but the hardest problems are those that arise concerning ways of being conscious these ways taken together are called the cognitive elements in mind and it is these that will occupy us most during the following lectures there is one element which seems obviously in common among the different ways of being conscious and that is that they are all directed to objects we are conscious of something the consciousness it seems is one thing and that of which we are conscious is another thing unless we are to acquiesce in the view that we can never be conscious of anything outside our own minds we must say that the object of consciousness need not be mental though the consciousness must be i am speaking within the circle of conventional doctrines not expressing my own beliefs this direction towards an object is commonly regarded as typical of every form of cognition and sometimes of mental life altogether we may distinguish two different tendencies in traditional psychology there are those who take mental phenomena naively just as they would physical phenomena this school of psychologists tends not to emphasize the object on the other hand there are those whose primary interest is in the apparent fact that we have knowledge that there is a world surrounding us of which we are aware these men are interested in the mind because of its relation to the world because knowledge if it is a fact is a very mysterious one their interest in psychology is naturally centered in the relation of consciousness to its object a problem which properly belongs rather to theory of knowledge we may take as one of the best and most typical representatives of this school the austrian psychologist brentana whose psychology from the empirical standpoint though published in eighteen seventy four is still influential and was the starting point of a great deal of interesting work he says quote, every physical phenomenon is characterized by what the scholastics of the middle ages called the intentional also the mental inexistence of an object and what we although with not quite unambiguous expressions would call relation to a content 
direction towards an object, which is not here to be understood as a reality, or imminent objectivity. Each contains something in itself as an object, though not each in the same way. In presentation something is presented, in judgment something is acknowledged or rejected, in love something is loved, in hatred hated, in desire desired, and so on. This intentional inexistence is exclusively peculiar to psychical phenomena. No physical phenomenon shows anything similar, and so we can define psychical phenomena by saying that they are phenomena which intentionally contain an object in themselves. End quote. The view here expressed that relation to an object is an ultimate irreducible characteristic of mental phenomena is one which I shall be concerned to combat. Like Brentano, I am interested in psychology, not so much for its own sake as for the light that it may throw on the problem of knowledge. Until very lately I believed, as he did, that mental phenomena have essential reference to objects, except possibly in the case of pleasure and pain. Now I no longer believe this, even in the case of knowledge. I shall try to make my reasons for this rejection clear as we proceed. It must be evident at first glance that the analysis of knowledge is rendered more difficult by the rejection, but the apparent simplicity of Brentano's view of knowledge will be found, if I am not mistaken, incapable of maintaining itself, either against an analytic scrutiny or against a host of facts in psychoanalysis and animal psychology. I do not wish to minimize the problems. I will merely observe, in mitigation of our prospective labors, that thinking, however it is to be analyzed, is in itself a delightful occupation, and that there is no enemy to thinking so deadly as a false simplicity. Travelling, whether in the mental or the physical world, is a joy, and it is good to know that, in the mental world at least, there are vast countries still very imperfectly explored. The view expressed by Brentano has been held very generally, and developed by many writers. Among these we may take as an example his Austrian successor, Meinong. According to him, there are three elements involved in the thought of an object. These three he calls the act, the content, and the object. The act is the same in any two cases of the same kind of consciousness. For instance, if I think of Smith or think of Brown, the act of thinking in itself is exactly similar on both occasions. But the content of my thought the particular event that is happening in my mind is different when I think of Smith and when I think of Brown. The content, Meinong argues, must not be confounded with the object, since the content must exist in my mind at the moment when I have the thought, whereas the object need not do so. The object may be something past or future, it may be physical, not mental, it may be something abstract, like equality, for example, it may be something imaginary, like a golden mountain, or it may even be something self-contradictory, like a round square. But in all these cases, so he contends, the content exists when the thought exists, and is what distinguishes it as an occurrence from other thoughts. To make this theory concrete, let us suppose that you are thinking of St. Paul's, then, according to Meinong, we have to distinguish three elements which are necessarily combined in constituting the one thought. First, there is the act of thinking, which would be just the same whatever you were thinking about. Then there is what makes the character of the thought as contrasted with other thoughts. This is content. And finally, there is St. Paul's, which is the object of your thought. There must be a difference between the content of a thought and what it is about since the thought is here and now, whereas what it is about may not be. Hence it is clear that the thought is not identical with St. Paul's. This seems to show that we must distinguish between content and object. But if Meinong is right, there can be no thought without an object. The connection of the two is essential. The object may exist without the thought, but not the thought without the object. The three elements of act, content, and object are all required to constitute the one single occurrence called thinking of St. Paul's. The above analysis of a thought, though I believe it to be mistaken, 
is very useful as affording a schema in terms of which other theories can be stated. In the remainder of the present lecture I shall state in outline the view which I advocate, and show how various other views out of which mine has grown result from modifications of the threefold analysis into act, content, and object. The first criticism I have to make is that the act seems unnecessary and fictitious. The occurrence of the content of a thought constitutes the occurrence of the thought. Empirically, I cannot discover anything corresponding to the supposed act, and theoretically I cannot see that it is indispensable. We say, I think so and so, and this word I suggests that thinking is the act of a person. Meinong's act is the ghost of the subject, or what once was the full-blooded soul. It is supposed that thoughts cannot just come and go, but need a person to think them. Now, of course, it is true that thoughts can be collected into bundles, so that one bundle is my thoughts, another is your thoughts, and a third is the thoughts of Mr. Jones. But I think the person is not an ingredient in the single thought. He is rather constituted by relations of the thoughts to each other and to the body. This is a large question, which need not, in its entirety, concern us at present. All that I am concerned with for the moment is that the grammatical forms I think, you think, and Mr. Jones thinks are misleading if regarded as indicating an analysis of a single thought. It would be better to say it thinks in me like it rains here, or, better still, there is a thought in me. This is simply on the ground that what Meinong calls the act in thinking is not empirically discoverable, or logically deducible from what we can observe. The next point of criticism concerns the relation of content and object. The reference of thoughts to objects is not, I believe, the simple direct essential thing that Brentano and Meinong represented as being. It seems to me to be derivative, and to consist largely in beliefs, beliefs that what constitutes the thought is connected with various other elements which together make up the object. You have, say, an image of St. Paul's, or merely the word St. Paul's, in your head. You believe, however vaguely and dimly, that this is connected with what you would see if you went to St. Paul's, or what you would feel if you touched its walls. It is further connected with what other people see and feel, with services and the dean and chapter and Sir Christopher Wren. These things are not mere thoughts of yours, but your thought stands in a relation to them of which you are more or less aware. The awareness of this relation is a further thought, and constitutes your feeling that the original thought had an object. But in pure imagination you can get very similar thoughts without these accompanying beliefs, and in this case your thoughts do not have objects, or seem to have them. Thus, in such instances, you have content without object. On the other hand, in seeing or hearing it would be less misleading to say that you have object without content, since what you see or hear is actually part of the physical world, though not matter in the sense of physics. Thus the whole question of the relation of mental occurrences to objects grows very complicated and cannot be settled by regarding reference to objects as the essence of thoughts. All the above remarks are merely preliminary, and will be expanded later. Speaking in popular and unphilosophical terms, we may say that the content of a thought is supposed to be something in your head when you think the thought, while the object is usually something in the outer world. It is held that knowledge of the outer world is constituted by the relation to the object, while the fact that knowledge is different from what it knows is due to the fact that knowledge comes by way of contents. We can begin to state the difference between realism and idealism in terms of this opposition of contents and objects. Speaking quite roughly and approximately, we may say that idealism tends to suppress the object, while realism tends to suppress the content. Idealism, accordingly, says that nothing can be known except thoughts, and all the reality that we know is mental, while realism maintains that we know objects directly, in sensation certainly, and perhaps also in memory and thought. Idealism does not say that nothing can be known beyond the present thought, 
but it maintains that the context of vague belief, which we spoke of in connection with the thought of St. Paul's, only takes you to other thoughts, never to anything radically different from thoughts. The difficulty of this view is in regard to sensation, where it seems as if we came into direct contact with the outer world. But the Berkeleyan way of meeting this difficulty is so familiar that I need not enlarge upon it now. I shall return to it in a later lecture, and will only observe, for the present, that there seem to me no valid grounds for regarding what we see and hear as not part of the physical world. Realists, on the other hand, as a rule, suppress the content, and maintain that a thought consists either of act and object alone, or of object alone. I have been in the past a realist, and I remain a realist as regards sensation, but not as regards memory or thought. I will try to explain what seem to me to be the reasons for and against various kinds of realism. Modern idealism professes to be by no means confined to the present thought or the present thinker in regard to its knowledge. Indeed, it contends that the world is so organic, so dovetailed, that from any one portion the whole can be inferred, as the complete skeleton of an extinct animal can be inferred from one bone. But the logic by which this supposed organic nature of the world is nominally demonstrated appears to realists, as it does to me, to be faulty. They argue that, if we cannot know the physical world directly, we cannot really know anything outside our own minds. The rest of the world may be merely our dream. This is a dreary view, and they therefore seek ways of escaping from it. Accordingly, they maintain that in knowledge we are in direct contact with objects, which may be, and usually are, outside our own minds. No doubt they are prompted to this view in the first place by bias, namely by the desire to think that they can know of the existence of a world outside themselves. But we have to consider not what led them to desire the view, but whether their arguments for it are valid. There are two different kinds of realism, according as we make a thought consist of act and object, or of object alone. Their difficulties are different, but neither seems tenable all through. Take, for the sake of definitiveness, the remembering of a past event. The remembering occurs now and is therefore necessarily not identical with the past event. So long as we retain the act, this need cause no difficulty. The act of remembering occurs now, and has on this view a certain essential relation to the past event which it remembers. There is no logical objection to this theory, but there is the objection, which we spoke of earlier, that the act seems mythical, and is not to be found by observation. If, on the other hand, we try to constitute memory without the act, we are driven to a content, since we must have something that happens now, as opposed to the event which happened in the past. Thus, when we reject the act, which I think we must, we are driven to a theory of memory which is more akin to idealism. These arguments, however, do not apply to sensation. It is especially sensation, I think, which is considered by those realists who retain only the object. Their views, which are chiefly held in America, are in large measure derived from William James, and before going further it will be well to consider the revolutionary doctrine which he advocated. I believe this doctrine contains important new truth, and what I shall have to say will be in a considerable measure inspired by it. William James's view was first set forth in an essay, called Does Consciousness Exist? In this essay he explains how what used to be the soul has gradually been refined down to the transcendental ego, which, he says, attenuates itself to a thoroughly ghostly condition, being only a name for the fact that the content of experience is known. It loses personal form and activity, these passing over to the content, and becomes a bare bewusstheit or bewusstsein überhaupt, of which in its own right absolutely nothing can be said. I believe, he continues, that consciousness, when once it has evaporated to this estate of pure diaphaneity, is on the point of disappearing altogether. It is the name of a non-entity, and has no right to a place among first principles. 
those who still cling to it are clinging to a mere echo the faint rumour left behind by the disappearing soul upon the air of philosophy he explains that this is no sudden change in his opinions for twenty years past he says i have mistrusted consciousness as an entity for seven or eight years past i have suggested its non-existence to my students and tried to give them its pragmatic equivalent in realities of experience it seems to me that the hour is ripe for it to be openly and universally discarded his next concern is to explain away the air of paradox for james was never wilfully paradoxical undeniably he says thoughts do exist i mean only to deny that the word stands for an entity but to insist most emphatically that it does stand for a function there is i mean no aboriginal stuff or quality of being contrasted with that of which material objects are made out of which our thoughts of them are made but there is a function in experience which thoughts perform and for the performance of which this quality of being is invoked that function is knowing james's view is that the raw material out of which the world is built up is not of two sorts one matter and the other mind but that it is arranged in different patterns by its interrelations and that some arrangements may be called mental while others may be called physical my thesis is he says that if we start with the supposition that there is only one primal stuff or material in the world a stuff of which everything is composed and if we call that stuff pure experience then knowing can easily be explained as a particular sort of relation towards one another into which portions of pure experience may enter the relation itself is a part of pure experience one of its terms becomes the subject or bearer of the knowledge the knower the other becomes the object known end of part one Lecture One, Part Two, from Analysis of Mind, by Bertrand Russell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Neufeld. Lecture One: Recent Criticisms of Consciousness, Part Two after mentioning the duality of subject and object which is supposed to constitute consciousness he proceeds in italics experience i believe has no such inner duplicity and the separation of it into consciousness and content comes not by way of subtraction but by way of addition he illustrates his meaning by the analogy of paint as it appears in a paint shop and as it appears in a picture in the one case it is just saleable matter while in the other it performs a spiritual function just so i maintain he continues does a given undivided portion of experience taken in one context of associates play a part of a knower a state of mind of consciousness while in a different context the same undivided bit of experience plays the part of a thing known of an objective content in a word in one group it figures as a thought in another group as a thing he does not believe in the supposed immediate certainty of thought let the case be what it may in others he says i am as confident as i am of anything that in myself the stream of thinking which i recognize emphatically as a phenomenon is only a careless name for what when scrutinized reveals itself to consist chiefly of the stream of my breathing the i think which kant said must be able to accompany all my objects is the i breathe which actually does accompany them the same view of consciousness is set forth in the succeeding essay a world of pure experience the use of the phrase pure experience in both essays points to a lingering influence of idealism experience like consciousness must be a product not part of the primary stuff of the world it must be possible if james is right in his main contentions that roughly the same stuff differently arranged would not give rise to anything that could be called experience this word has been dropped by the american realists 
among whom we may mention specially Professor R. B. Perry of Harvard and Mr. Edwin B. Holt. The interests of this school are in general philosophy and the philosophy of the sciences, rather than in psychology. They have derived a strong impulsion from James, but have more interest than he had in logic and mathematics and the abstract part of philosophy. They speak of neutral entities as the stuff out of which both mind and matter are constructed. Thus Holt says, quote, If the terms and propositions of logic must be substantialized, they are all strictly of one substance, for which, perhaps, the least dangerous name is neutral stuff. The relation of neutral stuff to matter and mind we shall have presently to consider at considerable length. End quote. My own belief, for which the reasons will appear in subsequent lectures, is that James is right in rejecting consciousness as an entity, and that the American realists are partly right, though not wholly, in considering that both mind and matter are composed of a neutral stuff which, in isolation, is neither mental nor material. I should admit this view as regards sensations. What is heard or seen belongs equally to psychology and to physics, but I should say that images belong only to the mental world, while those occurrences, if any, which do not form part of any experience, belong only to the physical world. There are, it seems to me, prima facie, different kinds of causal laws, one belonging to physics and the other to psychology. The law of gravitation, for example, is a physical law, while the law of association is a psychological law. Sensations are subject to both kinds of laws, and are therefore truly neutral in Holt's sense. But entities subject only to physical laws, or only to psychological laws, are not neutral, and may be called respectively purely material and purely mental. Even those, however, which are purely mental will not have that intrinsic reference to objects which Bentano assigns to them, and which constitutes the essence of consciousness as ordinarily understood. But it is now time to pass on to other modern tendencies, also hostile to consciousness. There is a psychological school called behaviorists, of whom the protagonist is Professor John B. Watson, formerly of the Johns Hopkins University. To them also, on the whole, belongs Professor John Dewey, who, with James and Dr. Schiller, was one of the three founders of pragmatism. The view of the behaviorists is that nothing can be known except by external observation. They deny altogether that there is a separate source of knowledge called introspection, by which we know things about ourselves which we could never observe in others. They do not by any means deny that all sorts of things may go on in our minds. They only say that such things, if they occur, are not susceptible of scientific observation, and do not therefore concern psychology as a science. Psychology as a science, they say, is only concerned with behavior, that is, with what we do. This alone, they contend, can be accurately observed. Whether we think, meanwhile, they tell us, cannot be known. In their observation of the behavior of human beings, they have not so far found any evidence of thought. True, we talk a great deal, and imagine that in so doing we are showing that we think, but behaviorists say that the talk they have to listen to can be explained without supposing that people think. Where you might expect a chapter on thought processes, you come instead upon a chapter on the language habit. It is humiliating to find how terribly adequate this hypothesis turns out to be. Behaviorism is not, however, sprung from observing the folly of men. It is the wisdom of animals that has suggested the view. It has always been a common topic of popular discussion whether animals think. On this topic people are prepared to take sides without having the vaguest idea what they mean by thinking. Those who desired to investigate such questions were led to observe the behavior of animals, in the hope that their behavior would throw some light on their mental faculties. At first sight it might seem that this is so. People say that a dog knows its name because it comes when it is called and that it remembers its master because it looks sad in his absence, but wags its tail and barks when he returns. That the dog behaves in this way is matter of observation, 
but that it knows or remembers anything is an influence, and in fact a very doubtful one. The more such inferences are examined, the more precarious they are seen to be. Hence the study of animal behavior has been gradually led to abandon all attempt at mental interpretation, and it can hardly be doubted that, in many cases of complicated behavior, very well adapted to its ends, there can be no prevision of those ends. The first time a bird builds a nest, we can hardly suppose it knows that there will be eggs to be laid in it, or that it will sit on the eggs, or that they will hatch into young birds. It does what it does at each stage, because instinct gives it an impulse to do just that, not because it foresees or desires the result of its actions. Careful observers of animals, being anxious to avoid precarious inferences, have gradually discovered more and more how to give an account of the actions of animals without assuming what we call consciousness. It has seemed to the behaviorists that similar methods can be applied to human behavior, without assuming anything not open to external observation. Let us give a crude illustration, too crude for the authors in question, but capable of affording a rough insight into their meaning. Suppose two children in a school, both of whom are asked, what is six times nine? One says fifty-four, the other says fifty-six. The one, we say, knows what six times nine is, the other does not. But all that we can observe is a certain language habit. The one child has acquired the habit of saying six times nine is fifty-four, the other has not. There is no more need of thought in this than there is when a horse turns into its accustomed stable. There are merely more numerous and complicated habits. There is obviously an observable fact called knowing such and such a thing. Examinations are experiments for discovering such facts. But all that is observed or discovered is a certain set of habits in the use of words. The thoughts, if any, in the mind of the examinee are of no interest to the examiner, nor has the examiner any reason to suppose even the most successful examinee capable of even the smallest amount of thought. Thus what is called knowing, in the sense in which we can ascertain what other people know, is a phenomenon exemplified in their physical behavior, including spoken and written words. There is no reason, so Watson argues, to suppose that their knowledge is anything beyond the habits shown in this behavior. The inference that other people have something non-physical called mind or thought is therefore unwarranted. So far, we have been principally concerned with knowing, but it might well be maintained that desiring is what is really most characteristic of mind. Human beings are constantly engaged in achieving some end. They feel pleasure in success and pain in failure. In a purely material world, it may be said, there would be no opposition of pleasant and unpleasant, good and bad, what is desired and what is feared. A man's acts are governed by purposes. He decides, let us suppose, to go to a certain place, whereupon he proceeds to the station, takes his ticket, and enters the train. If the usual route is blocked by an accident, he goes by some other route. All that he does is determined, or so it seems, by the end he has in view, by what lies in front of him, rather than by what lies behind. With dead matter this is not the case. A stone at the top of a hill may start rolling but it shows no pertinacity in trying to get to the bottom. Any ledge or obstacle will stop it, and it will exhibit no signs of discontent if this happens. It is not attracted by the pleasantness of the valley, as a sheep or cow might be, but propelled by the steepness of the hill at the place where it is. In all this we have characteristic differences between the behavior of animals and the behavior of matter as studied by physics. Desire, like knowledge, is, of course, in one sense an observable phenomenon. An elephant will eat a bun, but not a mutton-chop. A duck will go into the water, but a hen will not. But when we think of our own desires, most people believe that we can know them by an immediate self-knowledge which does not depend upon observation of our actions. Yet if this were the case, it would be odd that people are so often mistaken as to what they desire. It is a matter of common observation that so-and-so does not know his own motives, or that A is envious of B and malicious about him, 
but quite unconscious of being so. Such people are called self-deceivers, and are supposed to have had to go through some more or less elaborate process of concealing from themselves what would otherwise have been obvious. I believe that this is an entire mistake. I believe that the discovery of our own motives can only be made by the same process by which we discover other people's, namely the process of observing our actions and inferring the desire which could prompt them. A desire is conscious when we have told ourselves that we have it. A hungry man may say to himself, Oh, I do want my lunch. Then his desire is conscious, but only differs from an unconscious desire by the presence of appropriate words, which is by no means a fundamental difference. The belief that a motive is normally conscious makes it easier to be mistaken as to our own motives than as to other people's. When some desire that we should be ashamed of is attributed to us, we notice that we have never had it consciously, in the sense of saying to ourselves, I wish that would happen. We therefore look for some other interpretation of our actions, and regard our friends as very unjust, when they refuse to be convinced by our repudiation of what we hold to be a calumny. Moral considerations greatly increase the difficulty of clear thinking in this matter. It is commonly argued that people are not to blame for unconscious motives, but only for conscious ones. In order, therefore, to be wholly virtuous, it is only necessary to repeat virtuous formulas. We say, I desire to be kind to my friends, honorable in business, philanthropic towards the poor, public-spirited in politics. So long as we refuse to allow ourselves, even in the watches of the night, to avow any contrary desires, we may be bullies at home, shady in the city, skinflints in paying wages, and profiteers in dealing with the public. Yet, if only conscious motives are to count in moral valuation, we shall remain model characters. This is an agreeable doctrine, and it is not surprising that men are unwilling to abandon it. But moral considerations are the worst enemies of the scientific spirit, and we must dismiss them from our minds if we wish to arrive at truth. I believe, as I shall try to prove in a later lecture, that desire, like force in mechanics, is of the nature of a convenient fiction for describing shortly certain laws of behavior. A hungry animal is restless until it finds food. Then it becomes quiescent. The thing which will bring a restless condition to an end is said to be what is desired. But only experience can show what will have this sedative effect and it is easy to make mistakes. We feel dissatisfaction, and think that such and such a thing would remove it. But in thinking this, we are theorizing, not observing a patent fact. Our theorizing is often mistaken, and when it is mistaken, there is a difference between what we think we desire and what in fact will bring satisfaction. This is such a common phenomenon that any theory of desire which fails to account for it must be wrong. What we have called unconscious desires have been brought very much to the fore in recent years by psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis, as everyone knows, is primarily a method of understanding hysteria and certain forms of insanity. But it has been found that there is much in the lives of ordinary men and women which bears a humiliating resemblance to the delusions of the insane. The connection of dreams, irrational beliefs, and foolish actions with unconscious wishes has been brought to light, though with some exaggeration, by Freud and Jung and their followers. As regards the nature of these unconscious wishes, it seems to me, though as a layman I speak with diffidence, that many psychoanalysts are unduly narrow. No doubt the wishes they emphasize exist, but others, for example for honor and power, are equally operative and equally liable to concealment. This, however, does not affect the value of their own general theories from the point of view of theoretic psychology, and it is from this point of view that their results are important for the analysis of mind. What, I think, is clearly established is that a man's action and beliefs may be wholly dominated by a desire of which he is quite unconscious, and which he indignantly repudiates when it is suggested to him. Such a desire is generally, in morbid cases, of a sort which the patient would consider wicked. If he had to admit that he had the desire, he would loathe himself. Yet it is so strong that it must force an outlet for itself. 
Hence it becomes necessary to entertain whole systems of false beliefs in order to hide the nature of what is desired. The resulting delusions in very many cases disappear if the hysteric or lunatic can be made to face the facts about himself. The consequence of this is that the treatment of many forms of insanity has grown more psychological and less physiological than it used to be. Instead of looking for a physical defect in the brain, those who treat delusions look for the repressed desire which has found this contorted mode of expression. For those who do not wish to plunge into the somewhat repulsive and often rather wild theories of psychoanalytic pioneers, it will be worth while to read a little book by Dr. Bernard Hart on The Psychology of Insanity. On this question of the mental as opposed to the physiological study of the cases of insanity, Dr. Hart says, quote, The psychological conception of insanity is based on the view that mental processes can be directly studied without any reference to the accompanying changes which are presumed to take place in the brain, and that insanity may therefore be properly attacked from the standpoint of psychology. End quote. This illustrates a point which I am anxious to make clear from the outset. Any attempt to classify modern views, such as I propose to advocate, from the old standpoint of materialism and idealism, is only misleading. In certain respects, the views which I shall be setting forth approximate to materialism. In certain others, they approximate to its opposite. On this question of the study of delusions, the practical effect of the modern theories, as Dr. Hart points out, is emancipation from the materialist method. On the other hand, as he also points out, imbecility and dementia still have to be considered physiologically as caused by defects in the brain. There is no inconsistency in this. If, as we maintain, mind and matter are neither of them the actual stuff of reality, but different convenient groupings of an underlying material, then clearly the question whether, in regard to a given phenomenon, we are to seek a physical or a mental cause is merely one to be decided by trial. Metaphysicians have argued endlessly as to the interaction of mind and matter. The followers of Descartes held that mind and matter are so different as to make any action of the one on the other impossible. When I move my arm, they said, it is not my will that operates on my arm, but God, who, by his omnipotence, moves my arm whenever I want it moved. The modern doctrine of psychophysical parallelism is not appreciably different from the theory of the Cartesian school. Psychophysical parallelism is the theory that mental and physical events each have causes in their own sphere, but run on side by side, owing to the fact that every state of the brain coexists with a definite state of mind, and vice versa. This view of the reciprocal causal independence of mind and matter has no basis except in metaphysical theory. For us, there is no necessity to make any such assumption which is very difficult to harmonize with obvious facts. I receive a letter inviting me to dinner. The letter is a physical fact, but my apprehension of its meaning is mental. Here we have an effect of matter on mind. In consequence of my apprehension of the meaning of the letter, I go to the right place at the right time. Here we have an effect of mind on matter. I shall try to persuade you, in the course of these lectures, that matter is not so material and mind not so mental as is generally supposed. When we are speaking of matter, it will seem as if we are inclining to idealism. When we are speaking of mind, it will seem as if we are inclining to materialism. Neither is the truth. Our world is to be constructed out of what the American realists call neutral entities, which have neither the hardness and indestructibility of matter or the reference to objects which is supposed to characterize mind. There is, it is true, one objection which might be felt, not indeed to the action of matter on mind, but to the action of mind on matter. The laws of physics, it may be urged, are apparently adequate to explain everything that happens to matter, even when it is matter in a man's brain. This, however, is only a hypothesis, not an established theory. There is no cogent empirical reason for supposing that the laws determining the motions of living bodies are exactly the same as those that appeal to dead matter. Sometimes, of course, they are clearly the same, 
when a man falls from a precipice or slips on a piece of orange peel his body behaves as if it were devoid of life these are the occasions that make bergson laugh but when a man's bodily movements are what we call voluntary prima facie very different in their laws from the movements of what is devoid of life i do not wish to say dogmatically that the difference is irreducible i think it is highly probable that it is not i say only that the study of the behavior of living bodies in the present state of our knowledge is distinct from physics the study of gases was originally quite distinct from that of rigid bodies and would never have advanced to its present state if it had not been independently pursued nowadays both the gas and the rigid body are manufactured out of a more primitive and universal kind of matter in like manner as a question of methodology the laws of living bodies are to be studied in the first place without any undue haste to subordinate them to the laws of physics boyle's law and the rest had to be discovered before the kinetic theory of gases became possible but in psychology we are hardly yet at the stage of boyle's law we need not be held up by the bogey of the universal rigid exactness of physics this is as yet a mere hypothesis to be tested empirically without any preconceptions it might be true or it might not so far that is all we can say returning from this digression to our main topic namely the criticism of consciousness we observe that freud and his followers though they have demonstrated beyond dispute the immense importance of unconscious desires in determining our actions and beliefs have not attempted the task of telling us what an unconscious desire actually is and have thus invested their doctrine with an air of mystery and mythology which forms a large part of its popular attractiveness they speak always as though it were more normal for a desire to be conscious and as though a positive cause had to be assigned for its being unconscious thus the unconscious becomes a sort of underground prisoner living in a dungeon breaking in at long intervals upon our daylight respectability with dark groans and maledictions and strange atavistic lusts the original reader almost inevitably thinks of this underground person as another consciousness prevented by what freud calls the censor from making his voice heard in company except on rare and dreadful occasions when he shouts so loud that every one hears him and there is a scandal most of us like the idea that we could be desperately wicked if only we let ourselves go for this reason the freudian unconscious has been a consolation to many quiet and well-behaved persons i do not think the truth is quite so picturesque as this i believe an unconscious desire is merely a causal law of our behavior namely that we remain restlessly active until a certain state of affairs is realized when we achieve temporary equilibrium if we know beforehand what this state of affairs is our desire is conscious if not unconscious the unconscious desire is not something actually existing but merely a tendency to a certain behavior it has exactly the same status as a force in dynamics the unconscious desire is in no way mysterious it is the natural primitive form of desire from which the other has developed through our habit of observing and theorizing often wrongly it is not necessary to suppose as freud seems to do that every unconscious wish was once conscious and was then in his terminology repressed because we disapproved of it on the contrary we shall suppose that although freudian repression undoubtedly occurs and is important it is not the usual reason for unconsciousness of our wishes the usual reason is merely that wishes are all to begin with unconscious and only become known when they are actively noticed usually from laziness people do not notice but accept the theory of human nature which they find current and attribute to themselves whatever wishes this theory would lead them to expect we used to be full of virtuous wishes but since freud our wishes have become in the words of the prophet jeremiah deceitful above all things and desperately wicked but these views in most of those who have held them are the product of theory rather than observation for observation requires effort whereas repeating phrases does not 
the interpretation of unconscious wishes which i have been advocating has been set forth briefly by professor john b watson in an article called the psychology of wish fulfillment which appeared in the scientific monthly in november nineteen sixteen two quotations will serve to show his point of view Quote, the freudians he says have made more or less of a metaphysical entity out of the censor they suppose that when wishes are repressed they are repressed into the unconscious and that this mysterious censor stands at the trap-door lying between the conscious and the unconscious many of us do not believe in the world of the unconscious a few of us even have grave doubts about the usefulness of the term consciousness hence we try to explain censorship along ordinary biological lines we believe that one group of habits can down another group of habits or instincts in this case our ordinary system of habits those which we call expressive of our real selves inhibit or quench keep inactive or partially inactive those habits and instinctive tendencies which belong largely in the past End quote. again after speaking of the frustration of some impulses which is involved in acquiring the habits of a civilized adult he continues quote, it is among these frustrated impulses that i would find the biological basis of the unfulfilled wish such wishes need never have been conscious and need never have been suppressed into freud's realm of the unconscious it may be inferred from this that there is no particular reason for applying the term wish to such tendencies End quote. One of the merits of the general analysis of mind which we shall be concerned with in the following lectures is that it removes the atmosphere of mystery from the phenomena brought to light by the psychoanalysts. Mystery is delightful, but unscientific, since it depends upon ignorance. Man has developed out of the animals, and there is no serious gap between him and the amoeba. Something closely analogous to knowledge and desire, as regards its effects on behavior, exists among animals even where what we call consciousness is hard to believe in something equally analogous exists in ourselves in cases where no trace of consciousness can be found it is therefore natural to suppose that whatever may be the correct definition of consciousness consciousness is not the essence of life or mind in the following lectures accordingly this term will disappear until we have dealt with words when it will re-emerge as mainly a trivial and unimportant outcome of linguistic habits. End of Lecture 1Please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Neufeld. Lecture 2. Instinct and Habit In attempting to understand the elements out of which mental phenomena are compounded, it is of the greatest importance to remember that from the protozoa to man there is nowhere a very wide gap either in structure or in behavior. From this fact it is a highly probable inference that there is also nowhere a very wide mental gap. It is, of course, possible that there may be, at certain stages in evolution, elements which are entirely new from the standpoint of analysis, though in their nascent form they have little influence on behavior and no very marked correlatives in structure. But the hypothesis of continuity in mental development is clearly preferable if no psychological facts make it impossible we shall find if i am not mistaken that there are no facts which refute the hypothesis of mental continuity and that on the other hand this hypothesis affords a useful test of suggested theories as to the nature of mind the hypothesis of mental continuity throughout organic evolution may be used in two different ways on the one hand it may be held that we have more knowledge of our own minds than those of animals and that we should use this knowledge to infer the existence of something similar to our own mental processes in animals and even in plants on the other hand it may be held that animals and plants present similar phenomena more easily analyzed than those of human minds on this ground it may be urged 
that explanations which are adequate in the case of animals ought not to be lightly rejected in the case of man. The practical effects of these two views are diametrically opposite. The first leads us to level up animal intelligence with what we believe ourselves to know about our own intelligence, while the second leads us to attempt a leveling down of our own intelligence to something not too remote from what we can observe in animals. It is therefore important to consider the relative justification of the two ways of applying the principle of continuity. It is clear that the question turns upon another, namely, which can we know best, the psychology of animals or that of human beings? If we can know most about animals, we shall use this knowledge as a basis for inference about human beings. If we can know most about human beings, we shall adopt the opposite procedure. And the question whether we can know most about the psychology of human beings or about that of animals turns upon yet another, namely, is introspection or external observation the surer method in psychology? This is a question which I propose to discuss at length in Lecture Six. I shall therefore content myself now with a statement of the conclusions to be arrived at. We know a great many things concerning ourselves which we cannot know nearly so directly concerning animals or even other people. We know when we have a toothache, what we are thinking of, what dreams we have when we are asleep, and a host of other occurrences which we only know about others when they tell us of them, or otherwise make them inferable by their behaviour. Thus, so far as knowledge of detached facts is concerned, the advantage is on the side of self-knowledge as against external observation. But when we come to the analysis and scientific understanding of the facts, the advantages on the side of self-knowledge become far less clear. We know, for example, that we have desires and beliefs, but we do not know what constitutes a desire or a belief. The phenomena are so familiar that it is difficult to realize how little we really know about them. We see in animals, and to a lesser extent in plants, behavior more or less similar to that which in us is prompted by desires and beliefs, and we find that as we descend on the scale of evolution, behavior becomes simpler, more easily reducible to rule, more scientifically analyzable and predictable. And just because we are not misled by familiarity, we find it easier to be cautious in interpreting behavior when we are dealing with phenomena remote from those of our own minds. Moreover, introspection, as psychoanalysis has demonstrated, is extraordinarily fallible, even in cases where we feel a high degree of certainty. The net result seems to be that, though self-knowledge has a definite and important contribution to make to psychology, it is exceedingly misleading, unless it is constantly checked and controlled by the test of external observation, and by the theories which such observation suggests when applied to animal behavior. On the whole, therefore, there is probably more to be learnt about human psychology from animals than about animal psychology from human beings. But this conclusion is one of degree, and must not be pressed beyond a point. It is only bodily phenomena that can be directly observed in animals, or even, strictly speaking, in other human beings. We can observe such things as their movements, their physiological processes, and sounds they emit. Such things as desires and beliefs, which seem obvious to introspection, are not visible directly by external observation. Accordingly, if we begin our study of psychology by external observation, we must not begin by assuming such things as desires and beliefs, but only such things as external observation can reveal, which will be characteristics of the movements and physiological processes of animals. Some animals, for example, always run away from light and hide themselves in dark places. If you pick up a mossy stone which is lightly embedded in the earth, you will see a number of small animals scuttling about from the unwanted daylight and seeking again the darkness of which you have deprived them. Such animals are sensitive to light, in the sense that their movements are affected by it, but it would be rash to infer that they have sensations in any way analogous to our sensations of sight. Such inferences, which go beyond the observable facts, are to be avoided with the utmost care. It is customary to divide human movements into three classes, voluntary, reflex, and mechanical. We may illustrate the distinction by a quotation from William James. Quote, 
if i hear the conductor calling all aboard as i enter the depot my heart first stops then palpitates and my legs respond to the air waves falling on my tympanum by quickening their movements if i stumble as i run the sensation of falling provides a movement of the hands towards the direction of the fall the effect of which is to shield the body from too sudden a shock if a cinder enter my eye its lids close forcibly and a copious flow of tears tends to wash it out these three responses to a sensational stimulus differ however in many respects the closure of the eye and the lacrimation are quite involuntary and so is the disturbance of the heart such involuntary responses we know as reflex acts the motion of the arms to break the shock of falling may also be called reflex since it occurs too quickly to be deliberately intended whether it be instinctive or whether it result from the pedestrian education of childhood may be doubtful it is at any rate less automatic than the previous acts for a man might by conscious effort learn to perform it more skilfully or even to suppress it altogether actions of this kind with which instinct and volition enter upon equal terms have been called semi-reflex that act of running towards the train on the other hand has no instinctive element about it it is purely the result of education and is preceded by a consciousness of the purpose to be attained and a distinct mandate of the will it is a voluntary act thus the animal's reflex and voluntary performances shade into each other gradually being connected by acts which may often occur automatically but may also be modified by conscious intelligence an outside observer unable to perceive the accompanying consciousness might be wholly at a loss to discriminate between the automatic acts and those which volition escorted but if the criterion for mind's existence be the choice of the proper means for the attainment of a supposed end all the acts alike seem to be inspired by intelligence for appropriateness characterizes them all alike End quote. there is one movement among those that james mentions at first which is not subsequently classified namely the stumbling this is the kind of movement which may be called mechanical it is evidently of a different kind from either reflex or voluntary movements and more akin to the movements of dead matter we may define a movement of an animal's body as mechanical when it proceeds as if only dead matter were involved for example if you fall over a cliff you move under the influence of gravitation and your centre of gravity describes just as correct a parabola as if you were already dead mechanical movements have not the characteristic of appropriateness unless by accident as when a drunken man falls into a water butt and is sobered but reflex and voluntary movements are not always appropriate unless in some very recondite sense a moth flying into a flame is not acting sensibly no more as a man who is in such a hurry to get his ticket that he cannot remember the name of his destination appropriateness is a complicated and merely approximate idea and for the present we shall do well to dismiss it from our thought as james states there is no difference from the point of view of the outside observer between voluntary and reflex movements the physiologist can discover that both depend upon the nervous system and he may find that the movements which we call voluntary depend upon higher centres in the brain than those that are reflex but he cannot discover anything as to the presence or absence of will or consciousness for these things can only be seen from within if at all for the present we wish to place ourselves resolutely in the position of outside observers we will therefore ignore the distinction between voluntary and reflex movements we will call the two together vital movements we may then distinguish vital from mechanical movements by the fact that vital movements depend for their causation upon the special properties of the nervous system while mechanical movements depend upon the properties which animal bodies share with matter in general there is need for some care if the distinction between mechanical and vital movements is to be made precise it is quite likely that if we knew more about animal bodies we could deduce all their movements from the laws of chemistry and physics it is already fairly easy to see how chemistry reduces to physics that is how the differences between different chemical elements can be accounted for by differences of physical structure 
the constituents of the structure being electrons, which are exactly alike in all kinds of matter. We only know in part how to reduce physiology to chemistry, but we know enough to make it likely that the reduction is possible. If we suppose it affected, what would become of the difference between vital and mechanical movements? Some analogies will make the difference clear. A shock to a mass of dynamite produces quite different effects from an equal shock to a mass of steel. In the one case there is a vast explosion, while in the other case there is hardly any noticeable difference. Similarly, we may sometimes find on a mountainside a large rock poised so delicately that a tut will set it crashing down into the valley, while the rocks all around are so firm that only a considerable force can dislodge them. What is analogous in these two cases is the existence of a great store of energy in unstable equilibrium ready to burst into violent motion by the addition of a very slight disturbance. Similarly, it requires only a very slight expenditure of energy to send a postcard with the words, All is discovered, fly. But the effect in generating kinetic energy is said to be amazing. A human body, like a mass of dynamite, contains a store of energy in unstable equilibrium, ready to be directed in this direction or that by a disturbance which is physically very small, such as a spoken word. In all such cases, the reduction of behavior to physical laws can only be effected by entering into great minuteness, so long as we confine ourselves to the observation of comparatively large masses, the way in which the equilibrium will be upset cannot be determined. Physicists distinguish between macroscopic and microscopic equations. The former determine the visible movements of bodies of ordinary size, the latter the minute occurrences in the smaller parts. It is only the microscopic equations that are supposed to be the same for all sorts of matter. The macroscopic equations result from a process of averaging out, and may be different in different cases. So, in our instance, the laws of macroscopic phenomena are different for mechanical and vital movements, though the laws of microscopic phenomena may be the same. We may say, speaking somewhat roughly, that a stimulus applied to the nervous system like a spark to dynamite, is able to take advantage of the stored energy in unstable equilibrium, and thus to produce movements out of proportion to the approximate cause. The movements produced in this way are vital movements, while mechanical movements are those in which the stored energy of a living body is not involved. Similarly, dynamite may be exploded, thereby displaying its characteristic properties, or may, with due precautions, be carted about like any other mineral. The explosion is analogous to vital movements, the carting about to mechanical movements. Mechanical movements are of no interest to the psychologist, and it has only been necessary to define them in order to be able to exclude them. When a psychologist studies behavior, it is only vital movements that concern him. We shall therefore proceed to ignore mechanical movements, and study only the properties of the remainder. The next point is to distinguish between movements that are instinctive and movements that are acquired by experience. This distinction also is to some extent one of degree. Professor Lloyd Morgan gives the following definition of instinctive behavior, quote, that which is on its first occurrence independent of prior experience, which tends to the well-being of the individual and the preservation of the race which is similarly performed by all members of the same more or less restricted group of animals, and which may be subject to subsequent modification under the guidance of experience." End quote. This definition is framed for the purposes of biology, and is in some respects unsuited to the needs of psychology. Though perhaps unavoidable, allusion to the same more or less restricted group of animals makes it impossible to judge what is instinctive in the behavior of an isolated individual. Moreover, the well-being of the individual and the preservation of the race is only a usual characteristic, not a universal one, of the sort of movements that, from our point of view, are to be called instinctive. Instances of harmful instincts will be given shortly. The essential point of the definition, from our point of view, is that an instinctive movement is independent of prior experience. We may say that an instinctive movement is a vital movement performed by an animal the first time that it finds itself in a novel situation. 
or, more correctly, one which it would perform if the situation were novel. The instincts of an animal are different at different periods of its growth, and this fact may cause changes of behavior which are not due to learning. The maturing and seasonal fluctuation of the sex instinct affords a good illustration. When the sex instinct first matures, the behavior of an animal in the presence of a mate is different from its previous behavior in similar circumstances, but is not learnt, since it is just the same if the animal has never previously been in the presence of a mate. On the other hand, a movement is learnt, or embodies a habit, if it is due to previous experience of similar situations, and is not what it would be if the animal had had no such experience. There are various complications which blur the sharpness of this distinction in practice. To begin with, many instincts mature gradually, and while they are immature, an animal may act in a fumbling manner which is very difficult to distinguish from learning. James maintains that children walk by instinct, and that the awkwardness of their first attempts is only due to the fact that the instinct has not yet ripened. He hopes that some scientific widower, left alone with his offspring at the critical moment, may ere long test this suggestion on the living subject. This, however this may be, he quotes evidence to show that the birds do not learn to fly, but fly by instinct when they reach the appropriate age. In the second place, instinct often gives only a rough outline of the sort of thing to do, in which case learning is necessary, in order to acquire certainty and precision in action. In the third place, even in the clearest cases of acquired habit, such as speaking, some instinct is required to set in motion the process of learning. In the case of speaking, the chief instinct involved is commonly supposed to be that of imitation, but this may be questioned. In spite of these qualifications, the broad distinction between instinct and habit is undeniable. To take extreme cases, every animal at birth can take food by instinct, before it has had opportunity to learn. On the other hand, no one can ride a bicycle by instinct, though, after learning, the necessary movements become just as automatic as if they were instinctive. The process of learning, which consists in the acquisition of habits, has been much studied in various animals. For example, you put a hungry animal, say a cat, in a cage which has a door that can be opened by lifting a latch. Outside the cage you put food. The cat at first dashes all round the cage, making frantic efforts to force a way out. At last, by accident, the latch is lifted, and the cat pounces on the food. Next day repeat the experiment, and you find that the cat gets out much more quickly than the first time although it still makes some random movements. The third day it gets out still more quickly, and before long it goes straight to the latch and lifts it at once. Or you make a model of the Hampton Court maze and put a rat in the middle, assaulted by the smell of food on the outside. The cat starts running down the passages and is constantly stopped by blind alleys, but at last, by persistent attempts, it gets out. You repeat this experiment day after day, you measure the time taken by the rat in reaching the food. You find that the time rapidly diminishes, and that after a while the rat ceases to make any wrong turnings. It is by essentially similar processes that we learn speaking, writing, mathematics, or the government of an empire. Professor Watson has an ingenious theory as to the way in which habit arises out of random movements. I think there is a reason why his theory cannot be regarded as alone sufficient, but it seems not unlikely that it is partly correct. Suppose, for the sake of simplicity, that there are just ten random movements which may be made by the animal, say, ten paths down which it may go, and that only one of these leads to food, or whatever else represents success in the case in question. Then the successful movement always occurs during the animal's attempts, whereas each of the others, on the average, occurs in only half the attempts. Thus the tendency to repeat a previous performance, which is easily explicable without the intervention of consciousness, leads to a greater emphasis on the successful movement than on any other, and in time causes it alone to be performed. The objection to this view, if taken as the sole explanation, is that an improvement ought to set in till after the second trial whereas experiment shows that already at the second attempt the animal does better than the first time. 
Something further is therefore required to account for the genesis of habit from random movements, but I see no reason to suppose that what is further required involves consciousness. Mr. Thorndike formulates two provisional laws of acquired behavior or learning, as follows. Quote, the law of effect is that, of several responses made to the same situation, those which are accompanied or closely followed by satisfaction to the animal will, other things being equal, be more firmly connected with the situation, so that when it occurs they will be more likely to recur. Those which are accompanied or closely followed by discomfort to the animal will, other things being equal, have their connections with that situation weakened, so that when it occurs they will be less likely to occur. The greater the satisfaction or discomfort, the greater the strengthening or weakening of the bond. The law of exercise is that any response to a situation will, other things being equal, will be more strongly connected with the situation in proportion to the number of times it has been connected with that situation, and to the average vigor and duration of the connections. End quote. With the explanation to be presently given of the meaning of satisfaction and discomfort, there seems every reason to accept these two laws. What is true of animals, as regards instinct and habit, is equally true of men. But the higher we rise in the evolutionary scale, broadly speaking, the greater becomes the power of learning, and the fewer are the occasions when pure instinct is exhibited unmodified in adult life. This applies with great force to man, so much so that some have thought instinct less important in the life of man than in that of animals. This, however, would be a mistake. Learning is only possible when instinct supplies the driving force. The animals in cages, which gradually learn to get out, perform random movements at first, which are purely instinctive. But for these random movements they would never acquire the experience which afterwards enables them to produce the right movement. This is partly questioned by Hobhouse, wrongly, I think. Similarly, children learning to talk make all sorts of sounds, until one day the right sound comes by accident. It is clear that the original making of random sounds without which speech would never be learnt, is instinctive. I think we may say the same of all the habits and aptitudes that we acquire. In all of them there has been present throughout some instinctive activity, prompting at first rather inefficient movements, but supplying the driving force while more and more effective methods are being acquired. A cat, which is hungry, smells fish and goes to the larder. This is a thoroughly efficient method when there is fish in the larder and it is often successfully practiced by children. But in later life it is found that merely going to the larder does not cause fish to be there. After a series of random movements it is found that this result is to be caused by going to the city in the morning and coming back in the evening. No one would have guessed a priori that this movement of a middle-aged man's body would cause fish to come out of the sea into his larder. But experience shows that it does and the middle-aged man therefore continues to go to the city, just as the cat in the cage continues to lift the latch when it has once found it. Of course, in actual fact, human learning is rendered easier, though psychologically more complex, through language. But at bottom, language does not alter the essential character of learning, or of the part played by instinct in promoting learning. Language, however, is a subject upon which I do not wish to speak until a later lecture. The popular conception of instinct errs by imagining it to be infallible and preternaturally wise, as well as incapable of modification. This is a complete delusion. Instinct, as a rule, is very rough and ready, able to achieve its result under ordinary circumstances, but easily misled by anything unusual. Chicks follow their mother by instinct, but when they are quite young they will follow with equal readiness any moving object remotely resembling their mother, or even a human being. Bergson, quoting Faber, has made play with the supposed extraordinary accuracy of the solitary wasp Ammophila, which lays its eggs in a caterpillar. On this subject I will quote from Draver's Instinct in Man. Quote, According to Faber's observations, which Bergson accepts, the Ammophila stings its prey exactly and unerringly in each of the nervous centers. 
The result is that the caterpillar is paralyzed, but not immediately killed, the advantage of this being that the larvae cannot be injured by any movement of the caterpillar upon which the egg is deposited, and is provided with fresh meat when the time comes. Now, Dr. and Mrs. Peckham have shown that the sting of the wasp is not unerring, as Faber alleges, that the number of stings is not constant, that sometimes the caterpillar is not paralyzed, and sometimes it is killed outright, and that the different circumstances do not apparently make any difference to the larva, which is not injured by slight movements of the caterpillar, nor by consuming food decomposed, rather than fresh caterpillar." End quote. This illustrates how love of the marvellous may mislead even so careful an observer as Faber, and so eminent a philosopher as Bergson. In the same chapter of Dr. Draver's book there are some interesting examples of the mistakes made by instinct. I will quote one as an example. Quote, the larva of the Lomacusa beetle eats the young of the ants in whose nest it is reared. Nevertheless, the ants tend the Lomachusa larva with the same care they bestow on their own young. Not only so, but they apparently discover that the methods of feeding, which suit their own larva, would prove fatal to the guests, and accordingly they change their whole system of nursing. End quote. Zeman, gives a good illustration of an instinct growing wiser through experience. He relates how hunters attract stags by imitating the sounds of other members of their species, male or female, but find that the older a stag becomes, the more difficult it is to deceive him, and the more accurate the imitation has to be. The literature of instinct is vast, and illustrations might be multiplied indefinitely. The main points as regards instinct which need to be emphasized as against the popular conceptions of it, are 1. The instinct requires no prevision of the biological end which it serves. 2. That instinct is only adapted to achieve this end in the usual circumstances of the animal in question, and has no more precision than is necessary for his success, as a rule. 3. That processes initiated by instinct often come to be performed better after experience. 4 that instinct supplies the impulses to experimental movements which are required for the process of learning. 5. That instincts in their nascent stages are easily modifiable, and capable of being attached to various sorts of objects. All the above characteristics of instinct can be established by purely external observation, except the fact that instinct does not require prevision. This, though not strictly capable of being proved by observation, is irresistibly suggested by the most obvious phenomena. Who can believe, for example, that a newborn baby is aware of the necessity of food for preserving life, or that insects, in laying eggs, are concerned for the preservation of their species? The essence of instincts, one might say, is that it provides a mechanism for acting without foresight in a manner which is usually advantageous biologically. It is partly for this reason that it is so important to understand the fundamental position of instinct in prompting both animal and human behavior. End of Lecture 2 Lecture 3 of The Analysis of Mind. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Analysis of Mind by Bertrand Russell. Lecture 3. Lecture 3. Desire and Feeling. Desire is a subject upon which, if I am not mistaken, true views can only be arrived at by an almost complete reversal of the ordinary, unreflecting opinion. It is natural to regard desire as in its essence an attitude towards something which is imagined, not actual. This something is called the end or object of the desire, and is said to be the purpose of any action resulting from the desire. We think of the content of the desire as being just like the content of a belief while the attitude taken up towards the content is different. According to this theory, when we say, I hope it will rain, or I expect it will rain, we express in the first case a desire, 
and in the second a belief with an identical content namely the image of rain it would be easy to say that just as belief is one kind of feeling in relation to this content so desire is another kind according to this view what comes first in desire is something imagined with a specific feeling related to it namely that specific feeling which we call desiring it the discomfort associated with unsatisfied desire and the actions which aim at satisfying desire are in this view both of them effects of the desire i think it is fair to say that this is a view against which common sense would not rebel nevertheless i believe it to be radically mistaken it cannot be refuted logically but various facts can be adduced which make it gradually less simple and plausible until at last it turns out to be easier to abandon it wholly and look at the matter in a totally different way the first set of facts to be adduced against the common sense view of desire are those studied by psychoanalysis in all human beings but most markedly in those suffering from hysteria and certain forms of insanity we find what are called unconscious desires which are commonly regarded as showing self-deception most psychoanalysts pay little attention to the analysis of desire being interested in discovering by observation what it is that people desire rather than in discovering what actually constitutes desire i think the strangeness of what they report would be greatly diminished if it were expressed in the language of a behaviorist theory of desire rather than in the language of everyday beliefs the general description of the sort of phenomena that bear on our present question is as follows a person states that his desires are so and so and that it is these desires that inspire his actions but the outside observer perceives that his actions are such as to realize quite different ends from those which he avows and that these different ends are such as he might be expected to desire generally they are less virtuous than his professed desires and are therefore less agreeable to profess than these are it is accordingly supposed that they really exist as desires for ends but in a subconscious part of the mind which the patient refuses to admit into consciousness for fear of having to think ill of himself there are no doubt many cases to which such a supposition is applicable without obvious artificiality but the deeper the freudians delve into the underground regions of instinct the further they travel from anything resembling conscious desire and the less possible it becomes to believe that only positive self-deception conceals from us that we really wish for things which are abhorrent to our explicit life in the cases in question we have a conflict between the outside observer and the patient's consciousness the whole tendency of psychoanalysis is to trust the outside observer rather than the testimony of introspection i believe this tendency to be entirely right but to demand a restatement of what constitutes desire exhibiting it as a causal law of our actions not as something actually existing in our minds but let us first get a clearer statement of the essential characteristic of the phenomenon a person we find states that he desires a certain end a and that he is acting with a view to achieving it we observe however that his actions are such as are likely to achieve a quite different end b and that b is the sort of end that often seems to be aimed at by animals and savages though civilized people are supposed to have discarded it we sometimes find a whole set of false beliefs of such a kind as to persuade the patient that his actions are really a means to a when in fact they are a means to b for example we have an impulse to inflict pain upon those whom we hate we therefore believe that they are wicked and that punishment will reform them this belief enables us to act upon the impulse to inflict pain while believing that we are acting upon the desire to lead sinners to repentance it is for this reason that the criminal law has been in all ages more severe than it would have been if the impulse to ameliorate the criminal had been what really inspired it it seems simple to explain such a state of affairs as due to self-deception but this explanation is often mythical most people in thinking about punishment have had no more need to hide their vindictive impulses from themselves than they have had to hide the exponential theorem our impulses are not patent to a casual observation but are only to be discovered by a scientific study of our actions in the course of which we must regard ourselves as objectively as we should the motions of the planets or the chemical reactions of a new element 
The study of animals reinforces this conclusion and is in many ways the best preparation for the analysis of desire. In animals, we are not troubled by the disturbing influence of ethical considerations. In dealing with human beings, we are perpetually distracted by being told that such and such a view is gloomy or cynical or pessimistic. Ages of human conceit have built up such a vast myth as to our wisdom and virtue that any intrusion of the mere scientific desire to know the facts is instantly resented by those who cling to comfortable illusions. But no one cares whether animals are virtuous or not, and no one is under the delusion that they are rational. Moreover, we do not expect them to be so conscious, and are prepared to admit that their instincts prompt useful actions without any provision of the ends which they achieve. For all these reasons, there is much in the analysis of mind which is more easily discovered by the study of animals than by the observation of human beings. We all think that, by watching the behavior of animals, we can discover more or less what they desire. If this is the case, and I fully agree that it is, desire must be capable of being exhibited in actions, for it is only the actions of animals that we can observe. They may have minds in which all sorts of things take place, but we can know nothing about their minds except by means of inferences from their actions. And the more such inferences are examined, the more dubious they appear. It would seem, therefore, that actions alone must be the test of the desires of animals. From this, it is an easy step to the conclusion that an animal's desire is nothing but a characteristic of a certain series of actions, namely, those which would be commonly regarded as inspired by the desire in question. And when it has been shown that this view affords a satisfactory account of animal desires, it is not difficult to see that the same explanation is applicable to the desires of human beings. We judge easily from the behavior of an animal of a familiar kind, whether it is hungry or thirsty, or pleased or displeased, or inquisitive or terrified. The verification of our judgment, so far as verification is possible, must be derived from the immediate succeeding actions of the animal. Most people would say that they infer first something about the animal's state of mind, whether it is hungry or thirsty, and so on, and thence derive their expectations as to its subsequent conduct. But this detour through the animal's supposed mind is wholly unnecessary. We can say simply, the animal's behavior during the last minute has had those characteristics which distinguish what is called hunger, and it is likely that its actions during the next minute will be similar in this respect, unless it finds food, or is interrupted by a stronger impulse such as fear. An animal which is hungry is restless. It goes to the places where food is often to be found. It sniffs with its nose, or peers with its eyes, or otherwise increases the sensitiveness of its sense organs. As soon as it is near enough to food for its sense organs to be affected, it goes to it with all speed and proceeds to eat. After which, if the quantity of food has been sufficient, its whole demeanor changes, it may very likely lie down and go to sleep. These things and others like them are observable phenomena distinguishing a hungry animal from one which is not hungry. The characteristic mark by which we recognize a series of actions which display hunger is not the animal's mental state, which we cannot observe, but something in its bodily behavior. It is this observable trait in the bodily behavior that I am proposing to call hunger, not some possibly mythical and certainly unknowable ingredient of the animal's mind. Generalizing what occurs in the case of hunger, we may say that what we call a desire in an animal is always displayed in a cycle of actions having certain fairly well-marked characteristics. There is first a state of activity consisting, with qualifications to be mentioned presently, of movements likely to have a certain result. These movements, unless interrupted, continue until the result is achieved, after which there is usually a period of comparative quiescence. A cycle of actions of this sort has marks by which it is broadly distinguished from the motions of dead matter. The most notable of these marks are 1 the appropriateness of the actions for the realization of a certain result. 2. The continuance of action until that result has been achieved. Neither of these can be pressed beyond a point. Either may be a. to some extent present in dead matter, and b. to a considerable extent absent in animals, while vegetables are intermediate, and display only a much fainter form of the behavior which leads us to attribute desire to animals. a. 
one might say rivers desire the seawater, roughly speaking, remains in restless motion until it reaches either the sea or a place from which it cannot issue without going uphill, and therefore we might say that this is what it wishes while it is flowing. We do not say so, because we can account for the behavior of water by the laws of physics, and if we knew more about animals we might equally cease to attribute desires to them since we might find physical and chemical reactions sufficient to account for their behavior. b. Many of the movements of animals do not exhibit the characteristics of the cycles which seem to embody desire. There are first of all the movements which are mechanical, such as slipping and falling, where ordinary physical forces operate upon the animal's body almost as if it were dead matter. An animal which falls over a cliff may make a number of desperate struggles while it is in the air but its center of gravity will move exactly as it would if the animal were dead. In this case, if the animal is killed at the end of the fall, we have, at first sight, just the characteristics of a cycle of actions embodying desire, namely, restless movement until the ground is reached, and then quiescence. Nevertheless, we feel no temptation to say that the animal desired what occurred, partly because of the obvious mechanical nature of the whole occurrence partly because when an animal survives a fall it tends not to repeat the experience there may be other reasons also but of them i do not wish to speak yet besides mechanical movements there are interrupted movements as when a bird on its way to eat your best peas is frightened away by the boy whom you are employing for that purpose if interruptions are frequent and completion of cycles rare the characteristics by which cycles are observed may become so blurred as to be almost unrecognizable. The result of these various considerations is that the differences between animals and dead matter, when we confine ourselves to external unscientific observation of integral behavior, are a matter of degrees and not very precise. It is for this reason that it has always been possible for fanciful people to maintain that even stocks and stones have some vague kind of soul. The evidence that animals have souls is so very shaky that, if it is assumed to be conclusive, one might just as well go a step further and extend the argument by analogy to all matter. Nevertheless, in spite of vagueness and doubtful cases, the existence of cycles in the behavior of animals is a broad characteristic by which they are prima facie distinguished from ordinary matter, and I think it is this characteristic which leads us to attribute desires to animals since it makes their behavior resemble what we do when, as we say, we are acting from desire. I shall adopt the following definitions for describing the behavior of animals. A behavior cycle is a series of voluntary or reflex movement of an animal, tending to cause a certain result and continuing until that result is caused, unless they are interrupted by death, accident, or some new behavior cycle. Here, accident may be defined as the intervention of purely physical laws causing mechanical movements. The purpose of a behavior cycle is the result which brings it to an end, normally by a condition of temporary quiescence, provided there is no interruption. An animal is said to desire the purpose of a behavior cycle while the behavior cycle is in progress. I believe these definitions to be adequate also to human purposes and desires, but for the present I am only occupied with animals and with what can be learnt by external observation. I am very anxious that no ideas should be attached to the words purpose and desire beyond those involved in the above definitions. We have not so far considered what is the nature of the initial stimulus to a behavior cycle, yet it is here that the usual view of desire seems on the strongest ground. The hungry animal goes on making movements until it gets food. It seems natural, therefore, to suppose that the idea of food is present throughout the process, and that the thought of the end to be achieved sets the whole process in motion. Such a view, however, is obviously untenable in many cases, especially where instinct is concerned. Take, for example, reproduction and the rearing of the young. Birds mate, build a nest, lay eggs in it, sit on the eggs, feed the young birds and care for them until they are fully grown. It is totally impossible to suppose that this series of actions which constitutes one behavior cycle is inspired by any provision of the end, at any rate the first time it is performed. We must suppose that the stimulus to the performance of each action is an impulsion from behind, not an attraction from the future. 
The bird does what it does at each stage because it has an impulse to that particular action, not because it perceives that the whole cycle of actions will contribute to the preservation of the species. The same considerations apply to other instincts. A hungry animal feels restless and is led by instinctive impulses to perform the movements which give it nourishment. But the act of seeking food is not sufficient evidence from which to conclude that the animal has the thought of food on its mind. Coming now to human beings, and to what we know about our own actions, it seems clear that what, with us, sets a behavior cycle in motion is some sensation of the sort which we call disagreeable. Take the case of hunger. We have first an uncomfortable feeling inside, producing a disinclination to sit still, a sensitiveness to savory smells, and an attraction towards any food that there may be in our neighborhood. At any moment during this process we may become aware that we are hungry, in the sense of saying to ourselves, I am hungry. But we may have been acting with reference to food for some time before this moment. While we are talking or reading, we may eat in complete unconsciousness, but we perform the actions of eating just as we should if we were conscious, and they cease when our hunger is appeased. What we call consciousness seems to be a mere spectator of the process. Even when it issues orders, they are usually, like those of a wise parent, just such as would have been obeyed even if they had not been given. This view may seem at first exaggerated, but the more our so-called volitions and their causes are examined, the more it is forced upon us. The part played by words in all this is complicated, and a potent source of confusions. I shall return to it later. For the present I am still concerned with primitive desire, as it exists in man, but in the form in which man shows his affinity to his animal ancestors. Conscious desire is made up partly of what is essential to desire, partly of beliefs as to what we want. It is important to be clear as to the part which does not consist of beliefs. The primitive, non-cognitive element in desire seems to be a push, not a pull, an impulsion away from the actual rather than an attraction towards the ideal. Certain sensations and other mental occurrences have a property which we call discomfort. These cause such bodily movements as are likely to lead to their cessation. When the discomfort ceases, or even when it appreciably diminishes, we have sensations possessing a property which we call pleasure. Pleasurable sensations either stimulate no action at all, or at most stimulate such action as is likely to prolong them. I shall return shortly to the consideration of what discomfort and pleasure are in themselves. For the present, it is their connection with action and desire that concerns us. Abandoning momentarily the standpoint of behaviorism, we may presume that hungry animals experience sensations involving discomfort and stimulating such movements as seem likely to bring them to the food which is outside the cages. When they have reached the food and eaten it, their discomfort ceases and their sensations become pleasurable. It seems, mistakenly, as if the animal had had this situation in mind throughout, when, in fact, they have been continually pushed by discomfort. And when an animal is reflective, like some men, it comes to think that it had the final situation in mind throughout. Sometimes it comes to know what situation will bring satisfaction, so that in fact the discomfort does bring the thought of what will allay it. Nevertheless, the sensation involving discomfort remains the prime mover. This brings us to the question of the nature of discomfort and pleasure. Since Kant, it has been customary to recognize three great divisions of mental phenomena, which are typified by knowledge, desire, and feeling, where feeling is used to mean pleasure and discomfort. Of course, knowledge is too definite a word. The states of mind concerned are grouped together as cognitive and are to embrace not only beliefs, but perceptions, doubts, and the understanding of concepts. Desire, also, is narrower than what is intended. For example, will is to be included in this category and in fact everything that involves any kind of striving, or conation as it is technically called. I do not myself believe that there is any value in this threefold division of the contents of mind. I believe that sensations, including images, supply all the stuff of the mind, and that everything else can be analyzed into groups of sensations related in various ways or characteristics of sensations or of groups of sensations. 
As regards belief, I shall give grounds for this view in later lectures. As regards desires, I have given some grounds in this lecture. For the present, it is pleasure and discomfort that concern us. There are broadly three theories that might be held in regard to them. We may regard them as separate existing items in those who experience them, or we may regard them as intrinsic qualities of sensations and other mental occurrences, or we may regard them as mere names for the causal characteristics of the occurrences which are uncomfortable or pleasant. The first of these theories, namely, that which regards discomfort and pleasure as actual contents in those who experience them, has, I think, nothing conclusive to be said in its favor. It is suggested chiefly by an ambiguity in the word pain, which has misled many people, including Berkeley, whom it supplied with one of his arguments for subjective idealism. We may use pain as the opposite of pleasure, and painful as the opposite of pleasant, or we may use pain to mean a certain sort of sensation, on a level with the sensations of heat and cold and touch. The latter use of the word has prevailed in psychological literature, and it is now no longer used as the opposite of pleasure. Dr. H. Head, in a recent publication, has stated this distinction as follows. It is necessary at the outset to distinguish clearly between discomfort and pain. Pain is a distinct sensory quality equivalent to heat and cold, and its intensity can be roughly graded according to the force expended in stimulation. Discomfort, on the other hand, is that feeling tone which is directly opposed to pleasure. It may accompany sensations not in themselves essentially painful, as for instance that produced by tickling the sole of the foot. The reaction produced by repeated pricking contains both these elements, for it invokes that sensory quality known as pain, accompanied by a disagreeable feeling tone, which we have called discomfort. On the other hand, excessive pressure, except when applied directly over some nerve trunk, tends to excite more discomfort than pain. The confusion between discomfort and pain has made people regard discomfort as a more substantial thing than it is and this, in turn, has reacted upon the view taken of pleasure, since discomfort and pleasure are evidently on a level in this respect. As soon as discomfort is clearly distinguished from the sensation of pain, it becomes more natural to regard discomfort and pleasure as properties of mental occurrences than to regard them as separate mental occurrences on their own account. I shall therefore dismiss the view that they are separate mental occurrences and regard them as properties of such experiences as would be called, respectively, uncomfortable and pleasant. It remains to be examined whether they are actual qualities of such occurrences or are merely differences as to causal properties. I do not myself see any way of deciding this question. Either view seems equally capable of accounting for the facts. If this is true, it is safer to avoid the assumption that there are such intrinsic qualities of mental occurrences as are in question, and to assume only the causal differences which are undeniable. Without condemning the intrinsic theory, we can define discomfort and pleasure as consisting in causal properties, and say only what will hold on either of the two theories. Following this course, we shall say, Discomfort is a property of a sensation or other mental occurrence consisting in the fact that the occurrence in question stimulates voluntary or reflex movements tending to produce some more or less definite change involving the cessation of the occurrence. Pleasure is a property of a sensation or other mental occurrence consisting in the fact that the occurrence in question either does not stimulate any voluntary or reflex movement or if it does, stimulates only such as tend to prolong the occurrence in question. Conscious desire, which we have now to consider, consists of desire in the sense hitherto discussed, together with a true belief as to its purpose, i.e., as to the state of affairs that will bring quiescence with cessation of the discomfort. If our theory of desire is correct, a belief as to its purpose may very well be erroneous since only experience can show what causes a discomfort to cease. When the experience needed is common and simple, as in the case of hunger, a mistake is not very probable. But in other cases, e.g., erotic desire in those who have had little or no experience of its satisfaction, mistakes are to be expected, and do in fact very often occur. 
The practice of inhibiting impulses, which is to a great extent necessary to civilized life, makes mistakes easier. By preventing experience of the actions to which a desire would otherwise lead, and by often causing the inhibited impulses themselves to be unnoticed or quickly forgotten. The perfectly natural mistakes which thus arise constitute a large portion of what is, mistakenly in part, called self-deception, and attributed by Freud to the censor. But there is a further point which needs emphasizing, namely, that a belief that something is desired has often a tendency to cause the very desire that is believed in. It is this fact that makes the effect of consciousness on desire so complicated. When we believe that we desire a certain state of affairs, that often tends to cause a real desire for it. This is due partly to the influence of words upon our emotions, in rhetoric, for example, and partly to the general fact that discomfort normally belongs to the belief that we desire such and such a thing that we do not possess. Thus, what was originally a false opinion as to the object of the a desire requires a certain truth. The false opinion generates a secondary, subsidiary desire, which nevertheless becomes real. Let us take an illustration. Suppose you have been jilted in a way which wounds your vanity. Your natural impulsive desire will be of the sort expressed in Don's poem, in which he explains how he will haunt the poor lady as a ghost and prevent her from enjoying a moment's peace. But two things stand in the way of your expressing yourself so naturally. On the one hand, your vanity which will not acknowledge how hard you are hit. On the other hand, your conviction that you are a civilized and humane person, who could not possibly indulge so crude a desire as revenge. You will, therefore, experience a restlessness which at first seems quite aimless, but will finally resolve itself in a conscious desire to change your profession, or go round the world, or conceal your identity and live in Putney like Arnold Bennett's hero. Although the prime cause of this desire is a false judgment as to your previous unconscious desire, yet the new conscious desire has its own derivative genuineness, and may influence your actions to the extent of sending you round the world. The initial mistake, however, will have effects of two kinds. First, in uncontrolled moments, under the influence of sleepiness or drink or delirium, you will say things calculated to injure the faithless deceiver. Secondly, you will find travel disappointing, and the East less fascinating than you had hoped, unless, some day, you hear that the wicked one has in turn been jilted. If this happens, you will believe that you feel sincere sympathy, but you will suddenly be much more delighted than before with the beauties of tropical islands or the wonders of Chinese art. A secondary desire, derived from a false judgment as to a primary desire, has its own power of influencing action, and is therefore a real desire according to our definition. But it has not the same power as a primary desire of bringing thorough satisfaction when it is realized. So long as the primary desire remains unsatisfied, restlessness continues in spite of the secondary desire's success. Hence arises a belief in the vanity of human wishes. The vain wishes are those that are secondary, but mistaken beliefs prevent us from realizing that they are secondary. What may, with some propriety, be called self-deception, arises through the operation of desires for beliefs. We desire many things which it is not in our power to achieve, that we should be universally popular and admired, that our work should be the wonder of the age, and that the universe should be so ordered as to bring ultimate happiness to all though not to our enemies, until they have repented and been purified by suffering. Such desires are too large to be achieved through our own efforts, but it is found that a considerable portion of the satisfaction which these things would bring us if they were realized is to be achieved by the much easier operation of believing that they are or will be realized. This desire for beliefs, as opposed to desire for the actual facts, is a particular case of secondary desire. And, like all secondary desire, its satisfaction does not lead to a complete cessation of the initial discomfort. Nevertheless, desire for beliefs, as opposed to desire for facts, is exceedingly potent both individually and socially.
According to the form of belief desired, it is called vanity, optimism, or religion. Those who have sufficient power usually imprison or put to death anyone who tries to shake their faith in their own excellence, or in that of the universe. It is for this reason that seditious libel and blasphemy have always been, and still are, criminal offenses. It is very largely through desires for beliefs that the primitive nature of desire has become so hidden, and that the part played by consciousness has been so confusing and so exaggerated. We may now summarize our analysis of desire and feeling. A mental occurrence of any kind, sensation, image, belief, or emotion, may be a cause of a series of actions continuing unless interrupted until some more or less definite state of affairs is realized. Such a series of actions we call a behavior cycle. The degree of definiteness may vary greatly. Hunger requires only food in general, whereas the sight of a particular piece of food raises a desire which requires the eating of that piece of food. The property of causing such a cycle of occurrences is called discomfort. The property of the mental occurrence in which the cycle ends is called pleasure. The actions constituting the cycle must not be purely mechanical, i.e., they must be bodily movements in whose causation the special properties of nervous tissue are involved. The cycle ends in a condition of quiescence, or of such action as tends only to preserve the status quo. The state of affairs in which this condition of quiescence is achieved is called the purpose of the cycle, and the initial mental occurrence involving discomfort is called a desire for the state of affairs that brings quiescence. A desire is called conscious when it is accompanied by a true belief as to the state of affairs that will bring quiescence, otherwise it is called unconscious. All primitive desire is unconscious, and in human beings, beliefs as to the purpose of desires are often mistaken. These mistaken beliefs generate secondary desires, which cause various interesting complications in the psychology of human desire, without fundamentally altering the character which it shares with animal desire. End of Lecture 3、Lecture、4 of the Analysis of Mind by Bertrand Russell. Lecture 4 Influence of Past History on Present Occurrences in Living Organisms. In this lecture, we shall be concerned with a very general characteristic which, broadly, though not absolutely, distinguishes the behavior of living organisms from that of dead matter. The characteristic in question is this the response of an organism to a given stimulus is very often dependent upon the past history of the organism. And not merely upon the stimulus and the hitherto discoverable present state of the organism. This characteristic is embodied in the saying, A burnt child fears the fire. The burn may have left no visible traces, yet it modifies the reaction of the child in the presence of fire. It is customary to assume that, in such cases, the past operates by modifying the structure of the brain, not directly. I have no wish to suggest that this hypothesis is false. I wish only to point out that it is a hypothesis. At the end of the present lecture, I shall examine the grounds in its favor. If we confine ourselves to facts which have been actually observed, we must say that past occurrences, in addition to the present stimulus and the present ascertainable condition of the organism, enter into the causation of the response. The characteristic is not wholly confined to living organisms. For example, Magnetized steel looks just like steel which has not been magnetized, but its behavior is in some ways different. In the case of dead matter, however, such phenomena are less frequent and important in the case of living organisms, and it is far less difficult to invent satisfactory hypotheses as to the microscopic changes of structure which mediate between the past occurrence and the present changed response. In the case of living organisms, practically everything that is distinctive both of their physical and of their mental behavior is bound up with this persistent influence of the past. Further, 
Speaking broadly, the change in response is usually of a kind that is biologically advantageous to the organism. Following a suggestion derived from semen, we will give the name of mnemic phenomena to those responses of an organism which, so far as hitherto observed facts are concerned, can only be brought under causal laws by including past occurrences in the history of the organism as part of the causes of the present response. I do not mean merely what would always be the case, that past occurrences are part of a chain of causes leading to the present event. I mean that in attempting to state the proximate cause of the present event, some past event or events must be included, unless we take refuge in hypothetical modifications of brain structure. For example, you smell peat smoke, and you recall some occasion when you smelt it before. The cause of your recollection, so far as hitherto observable phenomena are concerned, consists both of the peat smoke, present stimulus, and of the former occasion, past experience. The same stimulus will not produce the same recollection in another man who did not share your former experience, although the former experience left no observable traces in the structure of the brain. According to the maxim, same cause, same effect, we cannot therefore regard the peat smoke alone as the cause of your recollection, since it does not have the same effect in other cases. The cause of your recollection must be both the peat smoke and the past occurrence. Accordingly, your recollection is an instance of what we are calling mnemic phenomena. Before going further, it will be well to give illustrations of different classes of mnemic phenomena. A. Acquired Habits In Lecture 2, we saw how animals can learn by experience how to get out of cages or mazes, or perform other actions which are useful to them but not provided for by their instincts alone. A cat, which is put into a cage of which it has had experience, behaves differently from the way in which it behaved at first. We can easily invent hypotheses which are quite likely to be true as to connections in the brain caused by past experience, and themselves causing the different response. But the observable fact is that the stimulus of being in the cage produces differing results with repetition, and that the ascertainable cause of the cat's behavior is not merely the cage and its own ascertainable organization, but also its past history in regard to the cage. From our present point of view, the matter is independent of the question whether the cat's behavior is due to some mental fact called knowledge or displays a merely bodily habit. Our habitual knowledge is not always in our minds, but is called up by the appropriate stimuli. If we are asked, what is the capital of France, we answer, Paris. Because of past experience, the past experience is as essential as the present question in the causation of our response. Thus, all our habitual knowledge consists of acquired habits and comes under the head of mnemic phenomena. B. Images I shall have much to say about images in a later lecture. For the present, I am merely concerned with them insofar as they are copies of past sensations. When you hear New York spoken of, some image probably comes into your mind, either of the place itself, if you have been there, or of some picture of it, if you have not. The image is due to your past experience, as well as to the present stimulus of the words New York. Similarly, the images you have in dreams are all dependent upon your past experience, as well as upon the present stimulus to dreaming. It is generally believed that all images, in their simpler parts, are copies of sensations. If so, their mnemic character is evident. This is important, not only on its own account, but also because, as we shall see later, images play an essential part in what is called thinking. C association. The broad fact of association on the mental side is that when we experience something which we have experienced before, it tends to call up the context of the former experience. The smell of peat smoke recalling a former scene is an instance which we discussed a moment ago. This is obviously a mnemic phenomenon. There is also a more purely physical association, which is indistinguishable from physical habit. This is the kind studied by Mr. Thorndike in Animals, where a certain stimulus is associated with a certain act. This is the sort which is taught to soldiers in drilling, for example. In such a case, there need not be anything mental, but merely a habit of the body. There is no essential distinction between association and habit, 
and the observations which we made concerning habit as a mnemic phenomenon are equally applicable to association. d. Non-sensational elements in perception. When we perceive any object of a familiar kind, much of what appears subjectively to be immediately given is really derived from past experience. When we see an object, say a penny, we seem to be aware of its real shape. We have the impression of something circular, not of something elliptical. In learning to draw, it is necessary to acquire the art of representing things according to the sensation, not according to the perception, and the visual appearance is filled out with feeling of what the object would be like to touch, and so on. This filling out and supplying of the real shape, and so on, consists of the most usual correlates of the sensational core in our perception. It may happen that, in the particular case, the real correlates are unusual. For example, if what we are seeing is a carpet made to look like tiles. If so, the non-sensational part of our perception will be illusory, i.e., it will supply qualities which the object in question does not in fact have. But, as a rule, objects do have the qualities added by perception, which is to be expected since experience of what is usual is the cause of the addition. If our experience had been different, we should not fill out sensation in the same way, except in so far as the filling out is instinctive, not acquired. It would seem that, in man, all that makes up space perception, including the correlation of sight and touch and so on, is almost entirely acquired. In that case, there is a large mnemic element in all the common perceptions by means of which we handle common objects. And to take another kind of instance, Imagine what our astonishment would be if we were to hear a cat bark or a dog mew. This emotion would be dependent upon past experience and would therefore be a mnemic phenomenon according to the definition. E. Memory as knowledge. The kind of memory of which I am now speaking is definite knowledge of some past event in one's own experience. From time to time we remember things that have happened to us, because something in the present reminds us of them. Exactly the same present fact would not call up the same memory if our past experience had been different. Thus, our remembering is caused by 1. The present stimulus 2. The past occurrence It is therefore a mnemic phenomenon according to our definition. A definition of mnemic phenomena which did not include memory would of course be a bad one. The point of the definition is not that it includes memory, but that it includes it as one of the class of phenomena which embrace all that is characteristic in the subject matter of psychology. F. Experience. The word experience is often used very vaguely. James, as we saw, uses it to cover the whole primal stuff of the world, but this usage seems objectionable since, in a purely physical world, things would happen without there being any experience. It is only mnemic phenomena that embody experience. We may say that an animal experiences an occurrence when this occurrence modifies the animal's subsequent behavior, i.e., when it is the mnemic portion of the cause of the future occurrences in the animal's life. The burnt child that fears the fire has experienced the fire, whereas a stick that has been thrown on and taken off again has not experienced anything since it offers no more resistance than before to being thrown on. The essence of experience is the modification of behavior produced by what is experienced. We might, in fact, define one chain of experience, or one biography, as a series of occurrences linked by mnemic causation. I think it is this characteristic, more than any other, that distinguishes sciences dealing with living organisms from physics. The best writer on mnemic phenomena known to me is Richard Semon, the fundamental part of whose theory I shall endeavor to summarize before going further. When an organism, either animal or plant, is subjected to a stimulus, producing in it some state of excitement, the removal of this stimulus allows it to return to a condition of equilibrium. But the new state of equilibrium is different from the old, as may be seen by the changed capacity for reaction. The state of equilibrium before the stimulus may be called the primary indifference state, that after the cessation of the stimulus, the secondary indifference state. We define the engraphic effect of a stimulus as the effect in making a difference between the primary and secondary indifference state, 
and this indifference itself we define as the engram due to the stimulus. Mnemic phenomena are defined as those due to engrams. In animals they are specially associated with the nervous system, but not exclusively, even in man. When two stimuli occur together, one of them occurring afterwards may call out the reaction for the other also. We call this an ekphoric influence, and stimuli having this characteristic are called ekphoric stimuli. In such a case we call the engrams of the two stimuli associated. All simultaneously generated engrams are associated. There is also association of successfully aroused engrams, though this is reducible to simultaneous association. In fact, it is not an isolated stimulus that leaves an engram, but the totality of the stimuli at any moment. Consequently, any portion of this totality tends, if it reoccurs, to arouse the whole reaction which was aroused before. Semen holds that engrams can be inherited, and that an animal's innate habits may be due to the experience of its ancestors. On this subject he refers to Samuel Butler. Semen formulates two mnemic principles. The first, or law of engraphy, is as follows. All simultaneous excitements in an organism form a connected simultaneous excitement complex, which as such works engraphically, i.e. leaves behind a connected engram complex which in so far forms a whole. The second mnemic principle, or law of ekphory, is as follows. The partial return of the energetic situation which formerly worked engraphically operates ekphorically on a simultaneous engram complex. These two laws together represent in part a hypothesis, the engram, and in part an observable fact. The observable fact is that when a certain complex of stimuli has originally caused a certain complex of reactions, the reoccurrence of part of the stimuli tends to cause the reoccurrence of the whole of the reactions. Semon's application of his fundamental ideas in various directions are interesting and ingenious. Some of them will concern us later but for the present it is the fundamental character of mnemic phenomena that is in question concerning the nature of an engram semon confesses that at present it is impossible to say more than that it must consist in some material alteration in the body of the organism it is in fact hypothetical invoked for theoretical uses and not an outcome of direct observation no doubt physiology, especially the disturbances of memory through lesions in the brain, affords grounds for this hypothesis. Nevertheless, it does remain a hypothesis, the validity of which will be discussed at the end of this lecture. I am inclined to think that, in the present state of physiology, the introduction of the engram does not serve to simplify the account of mnemic phenomena. We can, I think, formulate the known laws of such phenomena in terms wholly of observable facts by recognizing provisionally what we may call mnemic causation. By this I mean that kind of causation of which I spoke at the beginning of this lecture, that kind, namely, in which the proximate cause consists not merely of a present event, but of this together with a past event. I do not wish to urge that this form of causation is ultimate, but that in the present state of our knowledge it affords a simplification and enables us to state laws of behavior in less hypothetical terms than we should otherwise have to employ. The clearest instance of what I mean is a recollection of a past event. What we observe is that certain present stimuli lead us to recollect certain occurrences, but that at times when we are not recollecting them, there is nothing discoverable in our minds that could be called memory of them. Memories, as mental facts, arise from time to time, but do not, as far as we can see, exist in any shape while they are latent. In fact, when we say that they are latent, we mean merely that they exist under certain circumstances. If, then, there is to be some standing difference between the person who can remember a certain fact and the person who cannot, that standing difference must be not anything mental, but in the brain. It is quite probable that there is such a difference in the brain, but its nature is unknown and it remains hypothetical. Everything that has, so far, been made matter of observation as regards this question can be put together in the statement, when a certain complex of sensations has occurred to a man, the reoccurrence of part of the complex tends to arouse the recollection of the whole. 
In like manner, we can call all mnemic phenomena in living organisms under a single law, which contains what is hitherto verifiable in Semon's two laws. This single law is, if a complex stimulus A has caused a complex reaction B in an organism, the occurrence of a part of A on a future occasion tends to cause the whole reaction B. This law would need to be supplemented by some account of the influence of frequency, and so on but it seems to contain the essential characteristic of mnemic phenomena, without admixture of anything hypothetical. Whenever the effect resulting from a stimulus to an organism differs according to the past history of the organism, without our being able to actually detect any relevant difference in its present structure, we will speak of mnemic causation, provided we can discover laws embodying the influence of the past. In ordinary physical causation, as it appears to common sense, we have approximate uniformities of sequence, such as lightning is followed by thunder, drunkenness is followed by headache, and so on. None of these sequences are theoretically invariable, since something may intervene to disturb them. In order to obtain invariable physical laws, we have to proceed to differential equations, showing the direction of change at each moment, not the integral change after a finite interval, however short. But, for the purposes of daily life, many sequences are to all intents and purposes invariable. With the behavior of human beings, however, this is by no means the case. If you say to an Englishman, you have a smut on your nose, he will proceed to remove it. But there will be no such effect if you say the same thing to a Frenchman who knows no English. The effect of words upon the hearer is anemic phenomena, since it depends upon the past experience which gave him understanding of the words. If there are to be purely psychological causal laws taking no account of the brain and the rest of the body, they will have to be of the form not X now causes Y now, but A, B, C. In the past together with X now cause Y now. For it cannot be successfully maintained that our understanding of a word, for example, is an actual existent content of the mind at times when we are not thinking of the word. It is merely what may be called a disposition, i.e., it is capable of being aroused whenever we hear the word or happen to think of it. A disposition is not something actual, but merely a mnemic portion of a mnemic causal law. In such a law as A, B, C, in the past, together with X now cause Y now, we will call A, B, C the mnemic cause, X the occasion or stimulus, and Y the reaction. All cases in which experience influences behavior are instances of mnemic causation. Believers in psychophysical parallelism hold that psychology can theoretically be freed entirely from all dependence on physiology or physics. That is to say, they believe that every psychical event has a psychical cause and a physical concomitant. If there is to be parallelism, it is easy to prove by mathematical logic that the causation in physical and psychical matters must be of the same sort, and it is impossible that mnemic causation should exist in psychology but not in physics. But if psychology is to be independent of physiology, and if physiology can be reduced to physics, it would seem that mnemic causation is essential in psychology. Otherwise, we shall be compelled to believe that all our knowledge, all our store of images and memories, all our mental habits, are at all times existing in some latent mental form, and are not merely aroused by the stimuli which led to their display. This is a very difficult hypothesis. It seems to me that if, as a matter of method rather than metaphysics, we desire to obtain as much independence for psychology as is practically feasible. We shall do better to accept mnemic causation in psychology protum and therefore reject parallelism, since there is no good ground for admitting mnemic causation in physics. It is perhaps worthwhile to observe that mnemic causation is what led Bergson to deny that there is causation at all in the psychical sphere. He points out very truly that the same stimulus repeated does not have the same consequences and he argues that this is contrary to the maxim, same cause, same effect. It is only necessary, however, to take account of past occurrences and include them with the cause in order to re-establish the maxim and the possibility of psychological causal laws. The metaphysical conception of a cause lingers in our manner of viewing causal laws. 
we want to be able to feel a connection between cause and effect, and to be able to imagine the cause as operating. This makes us unwilling to regard causal laws as merely observed uniformities of sequence, yet that is all that science has to offer. To ask why such and such a kind of sequence occurs is either to ask a meaningless question or to demand some more general kind of sequence which includes the one in question. The widest empirical laws of sequence known at any time can only be explained in the sense of being subsumed by later discoveries under wider laws. But these wider laws, until they in turn are subsumed, will remain brute facts resting solely upon observation, not upon some supposed inherent rationality. There is therefore no a priori objection to a causal law in which part of the cause has ceased to exist. To argue against such a law on the ground that what is past cannot operate now is to introduce the old metaphysical notion of cause, for which science can find no place. The only reason that could be validly alleged against mnemic causation would be that, in fact, all the phenomena can be explained without it. They are explained without it by Semon's engram, or by any theory which regards the results of experience as embodied in modifications of the brain and nerves. But they are not explained, unless with extreme artificiality, by any theory which regards the latent effects of experience as psychical rather than physical. Those who desire to make psychology as far as possible independent of physiology would do well, it seems to me, if they adopted mnemic causation. For my part, however, I have no such desire, and I shall therefore endeavor to state the grounds which occur to me in favor of some such view as that of the engram. One of the first points to be urged is that mnemic phenomena are just as much to be found in physiology as in psychology. They are even to be found in plants, as Sir Francis Darwin pointed out. Habit is a characteristic of the body at least as much as of the mind. We should, therefore, be compelled to allow the intrusion of mnemic causation, if admitted at all, into non-psychological regions, which ought, one feels, to be subject only to causation of the ordinary physical sort. The fact is that a great deal of what, at first sight, distinguishes psychology from physics is found, on examination, to be common to psychology and physiology. This whole question of the influence of experience is a case in point. Now it is possible, of course, to take the view advocated by Professor J. S. Haldane, who contends that physiology is not theoretically reducible to physics and chemistry but the weight of opinion among physiologists appears to be against him on this point, and we ought certainly to require very strong evidence before admitting any such breach of continuity as between living and dead matter. The argument from the existence of mnemic phenomena in physiology must therefore be allowed a certain weight against the hypothesis that mnemic causation is ultimate. The argument from the connection of brain lesions with loss of memory is not so strong as it looks though it has also some weight. What we know is that memory and mnemic phenomena generally can be disturbed or destroyed by changes in the brain. This certainly proves that the brain plays an essential part in the causation of memory, but does not prove that a certain state of the brain is, by itself, a sufficient condition for the existence of memory. Yet it is this last that has to be proved. The theory of the engram, or any similar theory, has to maintain that, Given a body and brain in a suitable state, a man will have a certain memory, without the need of any further conditions. What is known, however, is only that he will not have memories if his body and brain are not in a suitable state. That is to say, the appropriate state of body and brain is proved to be necessary for memory, but not to be sufficient. So far, therefore, as our definite knowledge goes, memory may require for its causation a past occurrence as well as a certain present state of the brain. In order to prove conclusively that mnemic phenomena arise whenever certain physiological conditions are fulfilled, we ought to be able actually to see differences between the brain of a man who speaks English and that of a man who speaks French, between the brain of a man who has seen New York and can recall it, and that of a man who has never seen that city. It may be that the time will come when this will be possible, but at present we are very far removed from it. At present there is, 
so far as I am aware, no good evidence that every difference between the knowledge possessed by A and that possessed by B is paralleled by some difference in their brains. We may believe that this is the case, but if we do, our belief is based upon analogies and general scientific maxims, not upon any foundation of detailed observation. I myself am inclined, as a working hypothesis, to adopt the belief in question and to hold that past experience only affects present behavior through modifications of physiological structure. But the evidence seems not quite conclusive so that I do not think we ought to forget the other hypothesis, or to reject entirely the possibility that mnemic causation may be the ultimate explanation of mnemic phenomena. I say this not because I think it likely that mnemic causation is ultimate, but merely because I think it possible, and because it often turns out important to the progress of science to remember hypotheses which have previously seemed improbable. End of Lecture 4「Section 6 of the Analysis of Mind」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Analysis of Mind by Bertrand Russell Section 7 The traditional conception of cause and effect is one which modern science shows to be fundamentally erroneous and requiring to be replaced by a quite different notion that of laws of change in the traditional conception our particular event a caused a particular event b and by this it was implied that given any event b some earlier event a could be discovered which had a relation to it such that whenever a occurred it was followed by b in this sequence there was something necessary not a mere de facto occurrence of a first then b the second point is illustrated by the old discussion as to whether it can be said that day causes night on the ground that day is always followed by night the orthodox answer was that day could not be called the cause of night because it would not be followed by night if the earth's rotation were to cease or rather to grow so slow that one complete rotation would take a year a cause it was held must be such that under no conceivable circumstances that it could fail to be followed by its effect as a matter of fact such sequences as were sought by believers in the traditional form of causation have not so far been found in nature everything in nature is apparently in a state of continuous change so that what we call one event turns out to be really a process if this event is to cause another event, the two will have to be contiguous in time, for if there is any interval between them, something may happen during that interval to prevent the expected effect. Cause and effect, therefore, will have to be temporally contiguous processes. It is difficult to believe, at any rate where physical laws are concerned, that the earlier part of the process, which is the cause, can make any difference to the effect so long as the later part of the process which is the cause remains unchanged suppose for example that a man dies of arsenic poisoning we say that his taking arsenic was the cause of death but clearly the process by which he acquired the arsenic is irrelevant everything that happened before he swallowed it may be ignored since it cannot alter the effect except in so far as it alters his condition at the moment of taking the dose but we may go further swallowing arsenic is not really the proximate cause of death since a man might be shot through the head immediately after taking the dose and then it would not be of arsenic that he would die the arsenic produces certain physiological changes which take a finite time before they end in death the earlier parts of these changes can be ruled out in the same way as we can rule out the process by which the arsenic was acquired proceeding this way we can shorten the process which we are calling the cause more and more similarly we shall have to shorten the effect it may happen that immediately after the man's death his body is blown to pieces by a bomb we cannot say what will happen after the man's death through merely knowing that he has died as a result of arsenic poisoning thus if we are to take the cause as one event and the effect as another both must be shortened indefinitely the result is that we merely have as the embodiment of our causal law a certain direction of change at each moment 
Hence, we are brought to differential equations as embodying causal laws. A physical law does not say A will be followed by B, but tells us what acceleration a particle will have under given circumstances, i.e. it tells us how the particle's motion is changing at each moment, not where the particle will be at some future moment. Laws embodied in differential equations may possibly be exact but cannot be known to be so. All that we know empirically is approximate and liable to exceptions. The exact laws that are assumed in physics are known to be somewhere near the truth, but are not known to be true just as they stand. The laws that we actually know empirically have the form of the traditional causal laws, except that they are not to be regarded as universal or necessary. Taking arsenic is followed by death is a good empirical generalization. It may have the advantage that they deal with observable phenomena. We cannot observe infinitesimals, whether in time or space. We do not even know whether time and space are infinitely divisible. Therefore, rough empirical generalizations have a definite place in science, in spite of not being exact of universal. They are the data for more exact laws, and the grounds for believing that they are usually true are stronger than the grounds for believing that the more exact laws are always true. Science starts, therefore, from generalizations of the form a is usually followed by b this is the nearest approach that can be made to a causal law of the traditional sort it may happen in any particular instance that a is always followed by b but we cannot know this since we cannot foresee all the perfectly possible circumstances that might make the sequence fail or know that none of them will actually occur if however we know of a very large number of cases in which a is followed by b and few or none in which the sequence fails we shall in practice be justified in saying a causes b provided we do not attach to the notion of cause any of the metaphysical superstitions that have gathered about the word there is another point besides lack of universality and necessity which it is important to realize as regards causes in the above sense and that is a lack of uniqueness it is generally assumed that given any event there is some one phenomenon which is the cause of the event in question this seems to be a mere mistake cause in the only sense in which it can be practically applied means nearly invariable antecedent we cannot in practice obtain an antecedent which is quite invariable for this would require us to take account of the whole universe since something not taken account of may prevent the expected effect we cannot distinguish among nearly invariable antecedents one as the cause and the others as merely a concomitance the attempt to do this depends upon a notion of cause which is derived from will and will as we shall see later is not at all the sort of thing that it is generally supposed to be nor is there any reason to think that in the physical world there is anything even remotely analogous to what will is supposed to be if we can find one antecedent and only one that was quite invariable we could call that one the cause without introducing any notion derived from mistaken ideas about will but in fact if we could find one antecedent and only one that was quite invariable we could call that one the cause without introducing any notion derived from mistaken ideas about will but in fact we cannot find any antecedent that we know to be quite invariable and we can find many that are nearly so for example men leave a factory for dinner when the hooter sounds at twelve o'clock you may say that the hooter is the cause of their leaving but innumerable other hooters in other factories which also always sound at twelve o'clock have just as good a right to be called the cause thus every event has many nearly invariable antecedents and therefore many antecedents which may be called its cause the laws of traditional physics in the form in which they deal with movements of matter or electricity have an apparent simplicity which somewhat conceals the empirical character of what they assert a piece of matter as it is known empirically is not a single existing thing but a system of existing things when several people simultaneously see the same table they all see something different therefore the table which they are supposed to all see 
must be either a hypothesis or a construction the table is to be neutral as between different observers it does not favor the aspect seen by one man at the expense of that seen by another it was natural though to my mind mistake to regard the real table as the common cause of all the appearances which the table presents as we say to different observers but why should we suppose that there is some one common cause of all these appearances as we have just seen the notion of cause is not so reliable as to allow us to infer the existence of something that by its very nature can never be observed instead of looking for an impartial source we can secure neutrality by the equal representation of all parties instead of supposing that there is some unknown cause the real table behind the different sensations of those who are said to be looking at the table we may take the whole set of these sensations together possibly with certain other particulars as actually being the table that is to say the table which is neutral as between different observers actual and possible is a set of all those particulars which would naturally be called aspects of the table from different points of view it may be said if there is no single existence which is the source of all these aspects how are they collected together the answer is simple just as they would be if there were such a single existence the supposed real table underlying its appearances is in any case not itself perceived but inferred and the question whether such and such a particular is an aspect of this table is only to be settled by the connector of the particular in question with one or more particulars by which the table is defined that is to say even if we assume a real table the particulars which are its aspects have to be collected together by their relations to each other not to it since it is merely inferred from them we have only therefore to notice how they are collected together and we can then keep the collection without assuming any real table as distinct from the collection when different people see what they call the same table they see things which are not exactly the same owing to difference of point of view but which are sufficiently alike to be described in the same words so long as no great accuracy or minuteness is sought these closely similar particulars are collected together by their similarity primarily and more correctly by the fact that they are related to each other approximately according to the laws of perspective and of reflection and diffraction of light i suggest as a first approximation that these particulars together with such correlated others are unperceived jointly are the table and that a similar definition applies to all physical objects in order to eliminate the reference to our perception which introduces an irrelevant psychological suggestion i will take a different illustration namely stellar photography a photographic plate exposed on a clear night reproduces the appearance of the portion of the sky concerned with more or fewer stars according to the power of the telescope that is being used each separate star which is photographed produces its separate effect on the plate just as it would upon ourselves if we were looking at the sky if we assume as science normally does the continuity of physical processes we are forced to conclude that at the place where the plate is and at all places between it and a star which it photographs something is happening which is specially connected with that star in the days when the ether was less in doubt we should have said that what was happening was a certain kind of transverse vibration in the ether but it is not necessary or desirable to be so explicit all we need say is that something happens which is specially connected with the star in question it must be something specially connected with that star since that star produces its own special effect upon the plate whatever it is must be the end of a process which starts from the star and radiates outwards partly on general grounds of continuity partly to account for the fact that light is transmitted with a certain definite velocity we thus arrive at the conclusion that if a certain star is visible at a certain place or could be photographed by a sufficiently sensitive plate at that place something is happening there which is specially connected with that star therefore in every place at all times a vast multitude of things must be happening namely at least for every physical object which can be seen or photographed from that place we can classify such happenings on either of two principles we can collect together all the happenings in one place as is done by photography so far as light is concerned we can collect together all the happenings in different places 
which are connected in the way that common sense regards as being due to their emanating from one object thus to return to the stars we can collect together either all the appearances of different stars in a given place or all the appearances of a given star in different places but when i speak of appearances i do so only for brevity i do not mean anything that must appear to somebody but only that happening whatever it may be which is connected at the place in question with the physical object according to the old orthodox theory it would be a transverse vibration in the ether like the different appearances of a table to a number of simultaneous observers the different particulars that belong to one physical object are to be collected together by continuity and inherent laws of correlation not by their supposed causal connection with an unknown assumed existent called a piece of matter which would be a mere unnecessary metaphysical thing in itself a piece of matter according to the definition that i propose is as a first approximation the collection of all those correlated particulars which would normally be regarded as its appearances or effects in different places some further elaborations are desirable but we can ignore them for the present i shall return to them at the end of this lecture according to the view i am suggesting a physical object or piece of matter is a collection of all those correlated particulars which would be regarded by common sense as its effects or appearances in different places on the other hand all the happenings in a given place represent what common sense would regard as the appearances of a number of different objects as viewed from that place all the happenings in one place may be regarded as a view of the world from that place i shall call the view of the world from a given place a perspective a photograph represents a perspective on the other hand if photographs of the stars were taken in all points throughout space and in all such photographs a certain star say sirius were picked out whenever it appeared all the different appearances of sirius taken together would represent sirius for the understanding of the difference between psychology and its physics it is vital to understand these two ways of classifying particulars namely according to the place where they occur according to the system of correlated particulars in different places to which they belong such system being defined as a physical object given a system of particulars which is a physical object i shall define that one of the system which is in a given place as the appearance of that object in that place when the appearance of an object in a given place changes it is found that one or other of two things occurs the two possibilities may be illustrated by an example you are in a room with the man whom you see you may cease to see him either by shutting your eyes or by his going out of the room in the first case his appearance to other people remains unchanged in the second his appearance changes from all places in the first case you say that it is not he who has changed but your eyes in the second you say that he has changed generalizing we distinguish cases in which only certain appearances of the object change while others and especially appearances from places very near to the object do not change cases where all or almost all the appearances of the object undergo a connected change in the first case the change is attributed to the medium between the object and the place in the second it is attributed to the object itself it is the frequency of the latter kind of change and the comparatively simple nature of the laws governing the simultaneous alterations of appearances in such cases that have made it possible to treat a physical object as one thing and to overlook the fact that it is a system of particulars when a number of people at a theatre watch an actor the changes in their several perspectives are so similar and so closely correlated that all are popularly regarded as identical with each other and with the changes of the actor himself so long as all the changes in the appearances of the body are thus correlated there is no pressing prima facie need to break up the system of appearances or to realize that the body in question is not really one thing but a set of correlated particulars it is especially and primarily such changes that physics deals with i e it deals primarily with the processes in which the unity of a physical object need not be broken up because all its appearances change simultaneously according to the same law or if not at all at any rate from places sufficiently near to the object with increasing accuracy as we approach the object
the changes in appearances of an object which are due to changes in the intervening medium will not affect or will affect only very slightly the appearances from places close to the object if the appearances from sufficiently neighboring places are either wholly unchanged or changed to a diminishing extent which has zero for its limit it is usually found that the changes can be accounted for by changes in objects which are between the object in question and the places from which its appearance has changed appreciably thus physics is able to reduce the laws of most changes with which it deals to changes in physical objects and to state most of its fundamental laws in terms of matter it is only in those cases in which the unity of the system of appearances constituting a piece of matter has to be broken up that the statement of what is happening cannot be made exclusively in terms of matter the whole of psychology we shall find is included among such cases hence their importance for our purposes we can now begin to understand one of the fundamental differences between physics and psychology physics treats as a unit the whole system of appearances of a piece of matter whereas psychology is interested in certain of these appearances themselves confining ourselves for the moment to the psychology of perceptions we observe that perceptions are certain of the appearances of physical objects from the point of view that we have been hitherto adopting we might define them as the appearances of objects at places Places from which sense organs and the suitable parts of the nervous system form part of the intervening medium just as a photographic plate receives a different impression of a cluster of stars when a telescope is part of the intervening medium so a brain receives a different impression when an eye and an optic nerve are part of the intervening medium an impression due to this sort of intervening medium is called a perception and is interesting to psychology on its own account not merely as one of the set of correlated particulars which is the physical object of which as we say we are having a perception we spoke earlier of two ways of classifying particulars one way collects together the appearances commonly regarded as a given object from different places this is broadly speaking the way of physics leading to the construction of physical objects as sets of appearances the other way collects together the appearances of different objects from a given place the result being what we call a perspective in the particular case where the place concerned is a human brain the perspective belonging to the place consists of all perceptions of a certain man at a given time thus classification by perspective is relevant to psychology and is essential in defining what we mean by one mind i do not wish to suggest that the way in which i have been defining perceptions is the only possible way or even the best way it is a way that arose naturally out of our present topic but when we approach psychology from a more introspective standpoint we have to distinguish sensations and perceptions if possible from other mental occurrences if any we have also to consider the psychological effects of sensations as opposed to their physical causes and correlates these problems are quite distinct from those with which we have been concerned in the present lecture and i shall not deal with them until a later stage it is clear that psychology is concerned essentially with actual particulars not merely with systems of particulars in this it differs from physics which broadly speaking is concerned with the cases in which all the particulars which make up one physical object can be treated as a single causal unit or rather the particulars which are sufficiently near to the object of which they are appearances can be so treated the laws which physics seeks can broadly speaking be stated by treating such systems of particulars as causal units the laws which psychology seeks cannot be so stated since the particulars themselves are what interest the psychologist this is one of the fundamental differences between physics and psychology and to make it clear has been the main purpose of this lecture i will conclude with an attempt to give a more precise definition of a piece of matter the appearance of a piece of matter from different places change partly according to intrinsic laws the laws of perspective in the case of visual shape partly according to the nature of the intervening medium fog blue spectacles telescopes microscopes sense organs etc as we approach near to the object the effect of the intervening medium grows less in a generalized sense all the intrinsic laws of change or appearance may be called laws of perspective given any appearance of an object 
we can construct hypothetically a certain system of appearances to which the appearance in question would belong if the laws of perspective alone were concerned if we construct this hypothetical system for each appearance of the object in turn the system corresponding to a given appearance x will be independent of any distortion due to the medium beyond x and will only embody such distortion as is due to the medium between x and the object thus as the appearance by which our hypothetical system is defined is moved nearer and nearer to the object the hypothetical system of appearances defined by its means embodies less and less of the effect of the medium the different sets of appearances resulting from moving x nearer and nearer to the object will approach to a limiting set and this limiting set will be that system of appearances which the object would present if the laws of perspective alone were operative and the medium exercised no distorting effect this limiting set of appearances may be defined for purposes of physics as a piece of matter concerned end of section six